Please call the roll, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Friedman. Here. Councilmember Dominguez. Mayor Pro Tem Rouse. Here. Councilmember Hart. Here. Councilmember Snedden. Here. Mayor Murillo. Here. Are there any changes to the agenda, Mr. Casey? No, Madam Mayor. Okay. Any public comment um, items not on our agenda? Mm, I, I no, don't see no any. Steps. We'll close that. And Madam Clerk, our item for today? Item number three, subject fiscal year 2019 recommended operating and capital budget. Okay, so Mr. Casey, what do we have up today? It looks like waterfront to start with. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. So this is your first of a series of budget workshops that you have to go over in more detail each of the departmental recommendations in the proposed budget. Uh, we encourage you to hear the presentations, ask questions. If there's any feedback or changes you want to think about, it's nice to kind of give us a heads up and a feel for it today. We'll then come to you in early June with kind of a decision day where you then kind of balance all everything you've heard and kind of make any final directions that you give to us before we put the budget together. Today we're starting with three enterprise funds, the uh, Waterfront Department, Airport Department, and the Solid Waste Fund. So we'll start off with the Waterfront Department. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Reedman. Madam Mayor, Council Members, good afternoon. Um, Scott Reedman, Waterfront Director. Um, just to give you a quick overview of the Waterfront Department's proposed uh, budget for FY19. It's a, as you know, it's a mid-cycle budget, so we're trying to keep the changes minimal. Um, but it's a good opportunity to just tweak things and, and get on, keep on track. So in terms of the overview of the department, uh, we'll look at changes to the 2019 plan, fee adjustments for FY 2019, a quick look at a capital, our capital program, and some key performance objectives. Um, again, the, as Mr. Casey mentioned, the Waterfront Department is an enterprise fund, so we're dependent on the revenues that we bring in from our programs that we operate. Um, three principal programs, and Mr. Boss will go through those, but uh, property management is very significant, marina management, and parking is becoming more and more um, important. And the Waterfront Department doesn't receive any tax revenue and is also responsible for its own maintenance and funding its own capital projects. We have 47 full-time personnel. That includes myself and the other three managers five supervisors, um, 10 Harbor Patrol officers, sworn Harbor Patrol officers. We're short one right now and we're in a recruitment. Um, and we've been very stable over the years personnel wise. We just added one employee, uh, permanent employee in the last 15 years. I think that was a year or two ago. Um, Many of our, or several of our uh, divisions also utilize hourly employees. For instance, Harbor Patrol, facilities maintenance, and parking is a good example. Um, a lot more folks working in the summer, working part-time, students, and so forth in our hourly program. So the organization of the department, as you can see, just three main divisions, uh, myself, director, uh, beneath me, I have, um, or working with me, I have our executive assistant and our administrative analyst. And then going from left to right, we have our business services manager, Brian Bossy. He's in charge of property management, financial management, which is just our uh, three accounting people, and parking services. Harbor Operations, Mick Cronman is the manager for that, overseeing Harbor Patrol, and also marina management. And, and marina management is just all things on the water except for construction. It's boat measurements and making sure folks are in compliance with the marina rules and so forth. So a lot of involvement in that. Um, let's see what else I had on that. And then finally, uh, last but not least, Carl Triberg, our facilities manager. He oversees the facilities maintenance and also our facilities design and capital improvements. So he'll be talking a little bit about that later on. And with that, I will turn over the number stuff to Mr. Bossy. Thank you, Mr. Bossy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Um, I'm going to start off today with a few large picture um, pie charts, just to kind of get you 
get your mindset for where we're going today. Um, these will kind of put some general facts forward and then we'll get down into the details as we move through the presentation. So the pie chart you see here is our fiscal year 2019 summary of proposed expenditures. Our expenditures are about $15.5 million and they break down as follows, as you can see on the pie chart. Salaries and benefits at 48%, um, followed next by supplies and services, then our debt service, allocated costs, Worcester costs, excuse me, costs that um, every department pays and kind of pitches into based on your prorated amount, whether it be vehicle replacement, um, insurance, property insurance, things like that. Uh, then supplies and service, uh, sorry, I already said supplies and services. Then we have our special projects, uh, which for us is made up of our fireworks funding for the July 4th, as well as the parade of lights at the uh, start of December. And then equipment, that's not your standard equipment, that's hardware and software. Next is a big picture look at our uh, summary of revenues by fund. This is how we break it down in its simplest form at the Waterfront Department. Um, we're looking at about 15, uh, just shy of $15.3 million for fiscal year 2019. That is made up of 42% from marina management, 37% from property management, and then our parking services, uh, which includes eight parking lots, including Stearns Wharf and over 2,500 parking spaces, as well as the permits uh, that are included in there. We'll be talking about that a little later. And then financial management, that's our investment income that's handled by uh, the finance department. So jumping right in, our proposed changes to the fiscal year 2019 plan. Again, I'm gonna start you off easy with the pie chart and then we're gonna work down into some spreadsheets. Um, proposed expenditures by division. And I, I'll let you know that on the lower left-hand side, you'll see page B15. That's the page you'll find it in in your budget document if you wanna follow along. So our proposed expenditures by division, again, a little over $14.5 million. More detail, this is the same spreadsheet you'll see in your binder. Again, page B15, broken down. Um, overall, we're, looking, we're proposing about $338,000 increase in our expenditures. $315,000 of that, as you can see towards the bottom, it comes from our facility design and capital improvement program. That's about 93% of that $338,000. And the primary reason for that the reason for that is that with one of our uh, loans, outstanding loans with the Division of State Division of Boating and Waterways, we are taking that from a 30-year payback period to a 20-year payback period. Um, we have the resources currently available to do that, and that in the long run will save us millions of dollars. So that is our plan for now. So that's why you see that bump up. The, the principal increases significantly. Um, also, you'll see it's kind of a hodgepodge of ups and downs here. Uh, some a slight bit, a slight decline at admin support and community relations. Small increases in property management and financial management. Our parking services uh, is looking to go down by about eighteen thousand dollars. Then we have Harbor, Harbor Patrol, an increase of $34,000. That's with the anticipation that we'll be fully staffed by July 1st, which is our hope. And then a small uh, increase in marina management and a $22,000 increase uh, with our facilities maintenance program. That primarily has to do with one of our contracts. Um, we work with um, Work Inc., which is a local United Cerebral Palsy group, and they staff our um, harbor cleanup. Um, they work on all our restrooms, the walkways, the docks, emptying trash, cleaning bathrooms, 365 days a year. And this increase uh, has to do with the annual increases in the minimum wage amount. So that's going up a little bit every year. But they're a wonderful part of our community. They've been down there for, I believe we just celebrated 25 years with them, working with them. Flipping the page to revenue. Um, this is, again, a, a starter for you as far as a pie chart with our budgeted revenues. Again, a little shy of $15.3 million. You can find this information in spreadsheet form on page B8 of your budget binder. Um, and this is really when you get down into the details and start splitting things out. I showed you the basic uh, pie chart at the start, but then if you want to dig down further, this is what you get. 
and I can go over this. So this particular spreadsheet, you'll see the revenue category on the left, then our fiscal year 2018 projected, our fiscal year 2019 original plan, our recommended adjustments, and then our fiscal year 2019 recommendations. Um, not many changes to see here. Um, the first is on interest income. Um, we're looking at about uh, 115, almost $116,000 increase in that, which is nearly a 100% uh, increase. We'll take that any day. Um, that comes from interest earned on our reserves. Um, that's due to, as I'm sure Mr. Samario's been keeping up to speed, a, a positive growth in the, in the industry and rates. As far as parking fees and parking permits, we're looking at approximately $170,000 decline. And that's not something you usually see with us. Usually it's uh, constantly building up. The reason for this, the entire reason for this actually, that 170 is um, if you haven't noticed, there's a little project going on over at the uh, Cab Cabrillo Pavilion. And it's about a year and a half to two years. It's gonna take about a year and a half to two years. And so they, uh, as part of that process, part of that construction, um, the contractors are doing construction staging about 40% of both of our lots, each lot, both Cabrillo East and Cabrillo West, about 40% of that is fenced off and being used for them to store materials and have easy access to, to what they need. So we're ante anticipating uh, an obvious de decline in those particular revenues. As for our other lots, um, we're seeing slight increases to all of them. Uh, we have planned slight increases for all of those. Um, the only other change um, you'll see here is on our slip transfer fees. Um, as of the end, and this is when somebody moves, uh, uh, trades, this, not trades, um, moves out of a slip and has new people come into a slip. It's a slip <laughs> transfer. Um, and so there is a fee associated with that through the end of March at the end of the third quarter, we had 63 total transfers to the tune of about $925,000 in revenue. A number of years ago, you would see maybe 50 to 55 in an entire year. So the past two or three years, it's really been an active market down there. And so the $830,000 you'll see in the original plan, we're comfortable um, based on our analysis and working with the finance department that we can move that up uh, another $170 to a, a million dollars. We're anticipating this year probably about $1.2 million. Um, this is a, a very interesting uh, revenue source. It can drop <laughs> off in the, at any moment's notice um, and it has happened before, but it's been pretty consistent over the last number of years. So overall, our recommended adjustments um, to, are to the tune of 116, almost $117,000 to the positive as far as revenues are concerned. Mr. Rouse has a question. Thank you, Madam. Mr. Bossy, I was kind of, uh, I, I realized with the East Beach um, use for the construction, there are fewer parking spaces, but then there's kind of the, the trajectory of the funk zone parking and overflow into the garden lot and those other lots have that occupancy wise have you seen an increase there i was kind of actually surprised that you weren't at least revenue neutral if not ahead of the game hmm. uh, madam mayor council member Ross, that's a good good question we saw a spike in our garden street parking revenues um, during all the construction we had a lot of construction companies and their workers parking there during the day so we saw a lot of our, our permit activity increase um, the activity in the funk zone has created um, additional revenue down there. It seemed to have leveled off. I think what's happening is parking is so difficult down there. And with the age group that's generally associated with, with going down to the funk zone, they're doing the Uber and Lyft thing. So we have seen an increase. We'd love to see more of an increase. And I'm sure as, as Lower State Street starts to come online, we will see that increase at our Garden Street lot. So the sale of annual permits hasn't uh, spiked because of that with employees and whatnot? Madam Mayor, Council Member Ross, it, it has increased last year and the year before it increased slightly. Um, so this year will be a really good telltale sign is to see when we get in, when we start selling those December 1st to see how that area is kind of normalized and uh, we're hoping to see an increase obviously. Yeah. But activity overall in the waterfront has increased significantly since the funk zone came oh, thank on. Thank you. Mm, Mr. Dominguez. 
to follow up on the subject of permits, have you uh, looked at changing your fee structure either for commercial or non-commercial use? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, yes, we have. And we, we continue to look at that. Um, parking in the waterfront is, is an important asset for everybody. And our permit structure is different um, than downtown parking's permit structure. Um, we do have a number of other issues as well as in addition to the permits that we're currently looking at, size of vehicles and things like that. So it is on our plate. And I'll be talking about changes to our permit structure as we move on into the, the fee component. Thank you. Okay. And here we are, fee adjustments proposed for fiscal year 2019. Um, first, we have six, just to let you know, that we're proposing. The first is our slip rental fee. And we are proposing a 2% increase. This is similar to the past five fiscal years. Actually, I believe it's about eight fiscal years um, that we've been working on a gradual 2% increase. It's something that our slip holders have become used to and comfortable with. It's also part of our division and boating and division of division of boating and waterways um, loan for the Marina One uh, renovation program that is on its last and final phase. So that's a two percent increase we're proposing. Uh, we're also proposing a slip permit transfer fee. This is the fee I was talking about earlier, um, where we'd like to add another twenty-five dollars per foot increase for slips above 30 feet. Uh, the slips below 30, be 30 feet have all been frozen um, over the course of a number of years. Um, this is for all of those 30 feet and above. As far as our parking permit program, this is the first of two that we're proposing. Uh, this is the slip permittee parking permit. And what this is, is for each slip, there is one permit um, at this, available at this cost. Um, so you may have multiple owners on title, but only one person, first person in the door likely, gets this particular permit. It's otherwise known as our blue permit, um, and it allows you to park in the Harbor Main parking lot. Um, as long as your vehicle is operable, you can stay there 365 days a year. It's not something we encourage. We like people to move around, but it's for people coming in and out and using their boat. This has The last time this particular permit fee was increased was back in uh, back on July 1st of 2006. We're proposing a $25 increase, which would move it from $70 to $95. To put that another way, that's $7.92 a month uh, to park down at the waterfront or any one of our other um, waterfront lots except Stearns Wharf. The second of the public parking permit uh, proposed fee increases is a similar $25 increase. This is what's known as our red permit, the public permit. So you don't have to be a slip holder to have this, a slip permittee. Um, this is for the general public. And we're proposing it go from $100 to $125. Similarly, to put it on a monthly scale, that's $10.42 uh, to park down uh, and have easy beach access. Our visiting or transient vessel fee um, these are for folks moving up and down the coast, stopping into the harbor for a day or two, a week. This might be their destination. Um, we are proposing that vessels uh, 70 feet and above have an increase from, instead of a dollar per linear foot per night, uh, move that up to a dollar and 50. And that's primarily based on these vessels. Once you get above 70 feet, they're pretty intensive as far as their use on, on water and electrical. So this is to help with that, that cost. Mr. Friedman has a question or a comment. I have a, a question on this. What is the cost when a, when a vessel of 70 feet comes in? And uh, is this just cost re recovery that we're getting? Or is the, I'm trying to understand how much it costs when the vessel comes in and if we're recovering our costs. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Friedman, this is what you would, this is your cost if you were the boater coming in and you had a 70 foot vessel, you would pay the $70 per foot per night. Is it a cost recovery? It depends on how much, if they're plugged in, how much water they're using, are they filling their tanks, which can be extensive. Um, so I don't, I'm not quite sure if we're getting full cost recovery on this one. This is more just to help us pay for electricity and water when those larger vessels come in. Have we ever done any studies on if we are doing a cost recovery on it? or not, or, or how much per year would you, uh, do we take in revenue in this? Is it something that's so minuscule that we wouldn't do that? Or is there 
enough that we might want to consider looking at actual cost recovery. Madam Mayor, Council Member Friedman, the amount of seven, 70, the amount of vessels 70 feet and above is pretty limited. I think it ends up being um, between 20, generally between 25 and 30 dollars, uh, 25 and 30 vessels per year. So it's not such, it's not such an enormous amount of vessels coming in that, that it would necessitate a cost benefit analysis or how much of a cost recovery we're getting. We just noticed from these vessels in particular that it's significant enough that, that this dollar fifty would help pay the cost of what those folks come in at. Mr. Dominguez, your light's on. Is that just left over from, okay. Go ahead, Mr. Bossi. And lastly, a proposed um, increase on our annual West Beach boat rack permit fee. These are the racks you see out on West Beach closest to the rock groin. They're primarily used by the various clubs, um, uh, outrigger and kayak clubs. The increase would be moving that fee from $1,000 per year to $1,100 per year. Uh, I believe we have six racks out on the beach right now, and they each hold um, eight kayaks or outrigger canoes. Council Member Sneddon. I, I apologize for this question. If, if I have a West Beach boat permit, do I need to recuse myself from this or is this? Thank you, Mr. Kalan. Not yet. We, we will come to the, to the point where the council's acting on the, on the fees. Okay, thank you. And I believe Mr. Rouse would have an issue as well. Okay, thank you. So taking it back to the first uh, proposed um, fee change, people ask, what's a 2%? What does that mean as far as a slip fee is concerned? So every year we go out, this is part of an analysis we do. We um, have a very extensive inventory that we send out to 18 different marinas, uh, all the way from Santa Cruz down to Oceanside, both public and private. It's a wealth of information. There must be 50, 80 questions on there. Anything you can think of regarding fees or how they do processes and programs. And we continually come in as far as slip fees and things like that is, is more than competitive. We're, people want to be here. Um, our fees are low and it works and we have 100% occupancy. So part of the thing, one of the things we do is we look at how that 2% will impact folks. So we've got here on the left, your sl a slip length, a standard slip length, the change per foot, and then what that would cost you for m per month. So with a 20 foot slip, you're looking at about a $3.50 increase on your uh, monthly slip fee. Up to a 60 foot slip, you're looking at uh, just under $15 um, of an increase in your monthly slip fee. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, briefly to Mr. Carl Triberg to talk about our proposed capital program for fiscal year 2019. Thanks, hi Mr. Triberg. Hello, good afternoon uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, this year's um, Waterfront Capital Improvement Program has a relatively short list of projects, primarily because we just completed the largest project in decades at the waterfront. That was the Marina One Replacement Project. It was conducted, constructed over eight phases. It took about nine years to complete and it cost about $12 million. The final phase, phase eight, we just finished in March, I believe. And, Mar uh, March of this year? March of this year, yeah. And there was no ribbon cutting or fanfare? Yeah. <laughs> that was a really big deal. There was some deal. fanfare. We, uh, we're gonna have a party with the contractor and haven't had that yet. And if and when we do, perhaps the council members can be invited. Oh, please invite us, yeah. <laughs> we would love to. Um, that project, as uh, Brian mentioned, is funded primarily from a loan through the State Parks Division of Boating and Waterways. Uh, that loan, we renegotiated the terms from 30 years to 20 years, as Brian mentioned, to save quite a bit of money. The final phase we paid for out of our uh, reserves above capital to kind of keep our debt service down. Uh, the projects for this year, uh, Stearns Wharf uh, timber and pile replacement, that's the pile driving contract we have every year. It maintains the structural integrity of the wharf. I'd like to remind people that we have a people counter out there and there's about a million pedestrians and 250,000 cars on the wharf. So maintaining the structural integrity and the safety of the wharf is, is a primary um, responsibility of ours. Marina renovation program, this is the program where we rebuild the other marinas, two, three, and four. It's in our P3s. Uh, we replace 
uh, individual docks or staff reconstructs those and we replace dock boxes and all the different components to keep those current and as modern as we can. Uh, replacing hoist one and two is coming up this next year. We have four hoists on the city pier. They primarily serve the, our commercial fishing fleet and they're heavily used and uh, these are getting pretty old. They're over 30 years old and they're, uh, they are in constant use almost all day, every day. Um, Harborway sidewalk project is something we've worked with, a uh, conceptual plan with our transportation division. Anybody who drives down Harbor Way around noon realizes how busy it is. It's a, it's a good problem to have, but it also concerns us uh, regarding the safety of pedestrians and cars all in the same place at the same time. So this particular project, we're going to try and construct a new sidewalk, direct pedestrians to the Harbor commercial area and out of the main traffic in Harbor Way. In our parking lot maintenance program, we work with our uh, streets division, public works folks on uh, reslurring one of our seven lots every year. As I mentioned, this is a, a, a short list. This is about a couple million dollars less than most years. It was, we sort of anticipated this paying off phase eight in FY18. Uh, we have several studies underway for some large projects that will be, um, we'll have accurate cost estimates coming into our FY2020 through 25 capital improvement program. Those includes an elevator on Stearns Wharf, replacing the ice house, um, and also uh, the lift stations on the wharf. And these are big ticket projects, and we uh, need to do the studies at first and, and make sure we have accurate numbers to include in our future capital improvement program. Questions on that? No, we're good. Okay, moving on to our P3 for fiscal year 2019 um, pulled a number of key performance objectives um, for you today. The first is um, an important part of our revenue stream are cruise ships, and we will continue to monitor the California Air Resources Board policy updates to cruise ship at berth shore power regulations. Um, that has to do with the Cal California Air Resources Board, um, looking at the idea of changing some of their policies and programs at the state level. Um, it would have an impact on us, so we're staying abreast of that situation. Uh, Mr. Reedman and Dominique Samario, our admin analyst, have been up to Sacramento to discuss this particular issue with them. Um, next, we at the waterfront are very concerned with um, our, our customer service, our relationship with our tenants. We have uh, most, mostly wonderful relationships with our tenants. We're very active in both the Stearns Wharf Merchant Association as well as the Harbor Merchant Association, and we participate in various um, uh, marketing and promotional programs with them. We encourage them to advertise on their own as well, and we will continue to do that. Um, I believe we spend between sixty-five and seventy-five thousand dollars a year um, marketing the waterfront as a whole, both at, in the the wharf as well as uh, the harbor. Again, focusing on that customer service, um, our parking folks, as you can imagine, get a lot of phone calls and our goal is to return 95% of those customer phone calls within 24 hours. Um, we're very good at that and we look to continue to do that in the future. <coughs> Next, safety, obviously a very big concern down at the waterfront. And this is with our Harbor Patrol. I, Sorry, I was remiss. I should let you know that in parens after each of these bullet points is where you'll find those in your budget document. Um, as far as our Harbor Patrol is concerned, um, continue to coordinate joint agency response drills in the harbor. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but a uh, number of times a year, our Harbor Patrol folks will work with uh, city fire, city police department, the county sheriff, the county fire, uh, the Coast Guard, and a whole host of other governmental agencies working on issues of safety, and uh, they're gonna continue to do that. Again, another customer service related program um, because we are very much about having people return down to the harbor. As, and one of the things people are doing is they visit on their boats, they're coming up and down the coast depending on the season, and we, after a long day of sailing or motoring, we like to get them in their slip as fast as possible, so we like to, our goal is to process 96% of our visitor slip assignments within 30 minutes of their arrival. Um, so we like to get them processed and move them out so they can enjoy Santa Barbara and go downtown or do what they do. And lastly, um, replace 10 marina fingers in Marina 4. Um, this is, goes a long way towards the quality of people we have in our facilities and maintenance division. 
um, the depth and breadth of the skills that these folks have. Um, this is very impressive. They are going to build these 10 fingers themselves. So they will go, they will take the fingers off, um, and at the same time, they're building new ones, and then they'll replace those back. So it's, it's a compliment to just the wonderful, skilled folks we have down at the waterfront. So those are some of our key performance objectives. Again, you can find a whole, a whole host of these in your budget document. And looking at the Harbor Commission, um, we've been visiting with them on a monthly basis since uh, with the budget items since January of this year. So they're well versed with our proposed budget. And on the 19th of April at their meeting, they moved to forward a recommendation to city council for approval of the waterfront department's proposed fiscal year 2019 budget. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I'll start with a question about your customer phone calls. What do people call you about? Are they looking for restaurants or parking complaints? Madam Mayor, it's a little bit of everything. Um, they might be calling for the water department. Um, so we like to get back to them and tell them we're not the water de front, waterfront department. They also call for things. Um, wanting to can they reserve parking for weddings we our parking division um, is involved in over 300 special events every year it's every week this weekend for example i think on saturday alone we had three different runs in the waterfront that we had to help coordinate and runs going both ways crossing paths and the whole deal so um, everything from special events um, to what restaurants are good to what's out on the wharf where can i park uh, just they're Parking, our parking folks, when you come into the harbor, are the first people you see and the last people you see, depending <laughs> on what parking lot. So we really want to focus on customer service, and they really have to be a jack of all trades and know a whole lot about the waterfront and the harbor. And everything's going okay with the dredging operations? That's a, a, a federal um, um, function? Madam Mayor, yes, that's uh, funded through an annual appropriation by Congress. Uh, the Corps of Engineers manages it. This year, they completed the fall cycle and the spring cycle dredging. We also did another project. We did a lot of dredging off West Beach that was funded through our own reserves. So it was uh, quite an active year and uh, very successful. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dominguez, questions from you? I had a couple questions. So you mentioned the um, there's a loan you're... Um, prepaying or paying in 20 years instead of 30 years. What is the interest rate on that loan? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, that loan is with the division, State Division of Boating and Waterways. And as of June 30th of last year, which is when we get our figures uh, for this particular item, it was at $8.8 .8 million and the rate is at 4.5%. Okay, and, and I was curious about that just because I wondered if, if you were looking at any alternatives to paying that off early that might also um, bring a return on the investment like energy savings, like putting in solar panels. I don't know if you have any facilities that are real energy users where you could make an investment in terms of solar, solar that would have a, a higher return on the investment. Um, did you think about anything like that? Uh, Madam Mayor and Councilmember Dominguez, we've um, done quite a few in, the, in uh, with solar thermal projects on all the restrooms. All the water heaters are done through solar thermal projects. We've talked a little bit with our uh, facilities maintenance division and public works about solar panels like on the parking lots. It's not as conducive to doing it down at the waterfront for aesthetic reasons as compared to some of, some of the other parking lots that are a little more out of sight, out of mind. But we're still talking with them about that. And there's some other energy conservation projects that we'll, we will be working with them on into the future. And uh, some of the bigger projects we'll certainly bring back to council. Okay. The, uh, the next questions, I was curious about security and um, in particularly about people camping along the, the waterfront. What is, what is the status of that? And what, what new initiatives do you have? Or what can we do as a council to support increased security? Well, that's, Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, that's the, the question of the, of the age right now. Um, our patrol officers are there 24 hours a day, and they're very good at moving folks along. And uh, they generally know we sort of have our own little group down there, and they know where they hang out, and they move them along. Um, 
other than that, it's, you know, it's a huge problem citywide. So, you know, we do the best we can. We interface with the police department. Craig Burley uh, used to be on the Harbor Patrol and he comes down to our quarterly Harbor Patrol um, meetings occasionally and talks about the, uh, the programs that he works with and so forth. What about some of the encampments on the waterfront? Tents in particular, is that something that you can take an, a stance on? We really leave that, um, Council Member Dominguez, we really leave that up to the police department. We assist them when we can because we have four wheel drive vehicles that can help get them down there on the beach, but they're just behind that ice plant right on the East Beach primarily. And um, periodically they'll sweep through there when it becomes a real pro problem but it just sort of moves it over to the railroad tracks or up onto TV Hill, and it just, it, you're sort of just pushing people from place to place. Looks like someone came up who might have a... Uh, Council Member Dominguez, no, I just came up in case you had more questions about Hopper Patrol's activities, just to double down on what uh, uh, Director Reedman was saying. We contact campers every night in the lots or people who are getting ready to camp and bed down, and we... Uh, our officers politely explain to them the camping regulations. It's really <coughs> focused on the camping regulations, but there's always that, that little tangent that relates to parking regulations as well. But we focus on the camping regulations and we contact them on a nightly basis, so we're on it as much as we can be. As Director Reedman correctly stated, once you get east of Stearns Wharf, those tents and encampments, what have you, come under the jurisdiction of the police department. And so... Um the four-wheel drive vehicles, those are just daytime lifeguard vehicles, or what's their, their role? I'm not sure, C Council Member Dominguez, which four-wheel drive vehicles you're referring to. Patrol trucks. Oh, yeah. Well, we have them and the lifeguards have them. So, yes, we have 24-7 access to the beaches within our jurisdiction, which we usually don't go past Stearns Wharf unless there's an exigent, exigent circumstance or an emergency. Uh, we will go down there. But, we, yeah, we do take those down on the beach for various reasons. We have rescues that involve the patrol trucks. We have uh, contacts uh, on the beach, whether they be law enforcement related or emergency related. But yes, that's, we use those trucks on the beach as well. And so they don't have a regular nighttime patrol use? We do. If we, we, go, we, we either go down on the beach or we do foot patrols and we are one way or the other contacting individuals who are camping on the beaches. I thought you were talking about camping in the parking lots, but yes, we contact people from Stearns Wharf to Ledbetter Point who are camping on the beaches regularly, and we explain the camping regulations. And they're usually, usually innocent folks who just don't know, the, especially this time of year and moving into the summer, who don't know the regs, and they're camping, and we have a conversation with them, and then most of them we move along quite amiably. Now and then we have what we would call semi-cooperative or uncooperative contacts that require a little stronger hand, but uh, most of the time it works pretty smoothly, but yes is the bottom line answer. We contact those folks on a nightly basis. And so you mentioned Stearns Wharf mm -hmm. to Ledbetter. What about east of Stearns Wharf? We try not to get too far from the, our area of primary jurisdiction, which is the harbor and the, water, mm -hmm. and the waterfront proper, and so uh, almost all of our contacts are from Stearns Wharf uh, to the uh, west and the police department. And we work jointly with them on some calls, you know, not too far to the east, but we try not to get stretched too far, especially on shifts where we, where we might have a, a graveyard shift with a solo officer or uh, a situation like that. But uh, pretty much Stearns Wharf to Ledbetter part, Point is our primary area of jurisdiction. We get a call, we'll go to a Royal Borough for a boat rescue or down to uh, 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 the graveyard, you know, down the, uh, the down by the bird uh, uh, refuge to on boat calls and what have you. But we typically don't patrol those beaches in the trucks or by foot because uh, that's the police department jurisdiction and we get straight too far from our area of primary response and responsibility. So in terms of the parking lots and how you interface with the police department mm -hmm. then, when you have these meetings, do you go over the, the crime stats from your parking lots? I'm assuming that's something of concern or something that someone in your agency is monitoring or keeping an eye on? We do. Yes, sir, we do. And how are you finding the, uh, the statistics? Are they going up? Are they going down? They're pretty much level, actually. Okay. They're pretty much level. We average uh, most, of our, most of our crime down at the harbor, if you'll allow me, is illegal entries into the marinas and the restrooms. And we're working on that in various means, but we don't have uh, a lot of crime crime, if you will, a lot of burglaries or violent personal crimes or what have you, very minimal on that. 
the uh, uh, on an annual basis, we usually have 50 to 70 illegal entry uh, citations or and or arrests. Um, but we we follow up on felony warrant arrests. We work with the PD, and they're always there. We we back them, they back us, but because it's it's their primary jurisdiction. We're the first responders, right? They have primary jurisdiction throughout the waterfront. And so Harbor Patrol, because we're right on scene, if you will, uh, is, is utilized as first, re, first responders in, all, in a lot of these incidents. A lot of times we'll be running a call and we'll call PD for a back, knowing what the nature of the call is right off the bat. Sometimes they get called after contact and what have you. But we work hand in glove with them, and, and it's actually a very good working relationship. Thank you for the answer. And, and as far as I'm concerned, personally, I think you guys are doing a great job in, in terms of that. I just want to make sure there's kind of a system in place to keep an eye on the stats. So thank you. There is. We keep those stats. Thanks. Mr. Friedman? Well, I just want to say uh, it brings back memories being on the Harbor Commission in front of the four of you from years <laughs> ago. So uh, welcome <laughs> back. It's good to see you, uh, four of you again. And just wanted a couple things. I wanted to thank you for the Marina One project. Uh, it was very complex uh, as we went through it, and it was a, a really huge effort, and there was a lot of very technical issues you had to deal with throughout it, so I just wanted to um, congratulate you on that project. And then also uh, the work that you do for our commercial fisheries down there, I think it's something that we kind of forget here, but we have a working harbor, and we support our, our industry here. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the, the work that you do to support our fishing industry here. The one uh, kind of question I had, it's on D133 in our binders, if you want to look, is uh, we're proposing that there, it's uh, cruise ship passengers served, so we're proposing 36,000. A couple questions. Um, one is, what is the, the per capita uh, that we charge? And then the other is, how many cruise ships uh, does 36,000 passengers equate to? Madam Mayor, Council Member Friedman, um, as for the charge, uh, we uh, have worked with the cruise lines and it's now $7 per passenger. In the past, it used to be, we used to charge for the entire manifest, $5 um, for passengers as well, per head, as well as staff. But in working with them, that didn't seem to make sense to them um, because a lot of times the staff doesn't come off. So it's just the passengers now and it actually has worked to our benefit. This particular fiscal year, um, between the fall cycle and the spring cruise ship cycle, we're at about 21, which is significantly lower than we've been in the past. Um, we generally average around 28. Um, I think the high at one point was maybe a little over 30, but 28 seems to be a sweet spot. Um, we're hoping to get that again. Uh, we're hoping to get around the 28 mark next year, um, which would give you that 33,000 um, number. Again, these ships vary in size. Um, the current fiscal year, um, they're smaller in size and they're fewer. Um, and that's because the cruise ship industry is doing, there have been a number of um, buyouts and things like that, mergers. And so they're doing a global kind of shift in where their ships are. And so part of that is we're seeing fewer ships this year, but we're, uh, Dominique Samari, our, our admin analyst who um, heads up that cruise ship program, is very involved and in touch with the cruise ship industry, as is Mr. Reedman and we attend their meetings when we can, and so we are lobbying to get that number at least back up to that com comfortable 25, 26, 27 level. Very good. Um, Mr. Hart and then Ms. Sneddon. You mentioned um, earlier, I think Mr. Bossy did, about um, the survey that you do periodically regarding slip fees and the relationship of our fees to other harbors. Are you seeing that gap you know, in our lower fees grow? over time um, in relation to other harbors? Madam Mayor, Council Member Howard, no, it, it hasn't. Um, it hasn't grown too much. You know, um, we are lucky that we have, we're not lucky, we work very hard at it, getting 100% occupancy. A lot of these other places um, are at 50, 71, 80% occupancy. Um, but the 18 public and private marinas that we do research, I think everybody's kind of paying attention to everybody else. So it's, we pass this out. If you participate, we'll give you a completed version back. So I think everybody's kind of monitoring what everybody else is doing. So nobody's getting too out of whack as far as their, their various fees are concerned. So it kind of keeps everybody 
it keeps it a level playing field, if you will. And the 2% fee increase is you're sort of shooting for CPI-ish kind of number over time? That's generally what we're looking at, yeah. Okay. And then just the last question is, um, what are the department's sea level rise planning efforts? Um, Madam Mayor, Council Member Hart, uh, we've worked on a couple different things. As the council knows, the city's working on an updated local coastal program. As part of that is a sea level rise adaptation plan. Um, I'm working closely with our community development department. There's a couple of things that are notice, notable about that. One is how we protect the harbor from sea level rise. Scott and I have met with the Corps of Engineers. We also met with uh, Congressman Carbajal to talk about a future uh, study. Um, once the adaptation plan is done, it's highly likely that they're going to, it's going to recommend that we raise the rim of the bathtub, as I say, and that's improve the harbor works, make them higher. And that uh, lends itself to a study by an entity like the Corps of Engineers. They do these sort of things. So we've kind of planted the seed with our colleagues down in the L.A. District, as well as Congressman Carbajal, to try and get some congressional authorization for that. The other side of sea level rise adaptation has to do with uh, restoring kind of natural habitats like our dunes along East Beach. And we've been working with the Parks Department and Beacon. You sit on Beacon. Mm -hmm. Um, it, this is a joint powers agency, for those who don't know, that uh, is comprised of the two counties, Ventura and Santa Barbara County and all the coastal cities. And we're looking at a conceptual plan to enhance the dunes along East Beach and other areas within the region to see how resilient those would be. We want to try and advance a, dem a demonstration project along East Beach in an area um, you know, not too far w east of uh, Stearns Wharf where we could take the existing dune structures and enhance them, use native plants, add some sand, probably from West Beach where we tend to have surplus sand, and monitor it as, an, uh, as a demonstration. Agencies like the Coastal Conservancy are very interested in funding these kind of projects, as well as the Division of, of Boating and Waterways. They have a grant program as well. So the two ends of the adaptation spectrum, one is the, the hard structures like the harbors. We're working with the Corps of Engineers. The softer solutions, we would work with agencies like the Coastal Conservancy, working with Beacon. So we're looking at both of those right now. Um, the adaptation plan, I believe, will be done next year, and at that time, we'll it will help commit the city towards different solutions for adaptation. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll see those. Those will obviously come back to the council and, um, and talk more in detail about what we're planning on doing. But that's what we've done in the last year to kind of work on those things. Well, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, have you been thinking ahead to how you might fund the capital um, adaptation plan for the hard infrastructure? And is that something that there might be a slip fee, additional surcharge that would begin to accumulate funds? Or were you thinking in terms of state and federal grants to drive that? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Hart, the Corps of Engineers has traditionally funded some very, very large capital projects associated with ports and harbors. I think mm -hmm. that's the direction we would try and go. How it works frequently is with a feasibility study, a reconnaissance study, and then a project. And these mm -hmm. are these can take many, many years and even decades. Right. And that kind of lent, that time frame sort of lends itself to sea level rise adaptation. Mm -hmm. We would definitely try and pursue that uh, first before we would look to uh, raising slip fees. Our capital, we have quite a bit of debt right now that's going to get paid down um, in about 10 years for our, yeah. our bond debt and another 20 for this for the uh, Marina One project that we talked about. That's going to give us some um, borrowing power into the future for large, large-scale capital improvements that may be associated with sea level rise. So it's, we'd like to get the federal government or the state government to help us pay for it. If not, I think we have a long-term uh, capital improvement funding uh, plan that we could uh, take advantage of into the future. Good. Well, thank you. That gives me a lot of confidence in the effort. Council Member Sneddon. Um, thank you. I was just wondering about your stability of tenants. It seems like it's highly stable and how they're doing financially. It, it, it seems like it's still vital down there. Yeah. Madam Mayor, Council Member Sneddon, you are right on. Um, we have 100% occupancy. Uh, we field you know, double digit phone calls almost every week, uh, people looking for space. So what we do do is put people on a waiting, uh, a, an interested parties list. So if a space does come up, um, it's always part of a request for proposal process. It's very public. We make it very public. Um, so people like to be down in the harbor. Obviously, again, working harbor um, through our harbor master plan, we need to be focused on first and foremost people down there being um, 
marine related. Um, that doesn't always work out because that is kind of shrinking, um, but that is what we try and do is get people down there um, who are marine related. As far as how they're doing, um, obviously the, the, the fire and the mud flow, um, both in December and January, has had an impact on all of our tenants. Um, and, and we've looked at that obviously nowhere near the impact of the human side of things. So um, let's just, you all know that too. Let's make that clear. But they have had an impact where we've seen some good numbers in the past uh, month. Um, we've had some nice weather on some weekends. And, you know, once the weather turns good, regardless of what month it is, people come down to the waterfront. They come down to the wharf. As Carl mentioned earlier, we every year have well over a million visitors, um, pedestrians walking out onto the wharf. And again, we have a program that actually uh, picks up everybody's different heat, internal heat, and can count those people whether you are got your have your kid on your back or whatever. Wow. Um, so it's all coming, people coming out. We also have... Where are those? <laughs> we can't tell you that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're right as you walk on the wharf. Um, and then we also um, count our vehicles entering the wharf, and that's um, over 250,000 um, folks. So we're confident that with um, the recent weather turnaround and things like that, that, that we're going to see numbers are going to get back to normal next year. And I think we're going to finish um, pretty solid this year, too, and beat our, beat our budget estimates. And then I have a couple more questions, too. Thank you. Um, do you need to be planning for more intense storms? We had the microburst, debris flow, or is that part of the long-term planning? Is that affecting you? Madam Mayor, Council Member Sneddon, from, from a facility standpoint, we always kind of prepare for the worst. All the analyses that are done for engineering look at 100-year storms, the worst wave scenario and wind scenario. So that's part of the engineering process to begin with. Nothing necessarily related to what could happen, but I would try to be sort of ahead of that. Okay. And then just one more question about um, cruise ship water pollution. How is that monitored and where is that right now? Well, we have an agreement with the um, cruise ship industry, and we have a captain sign a captain's declaration for every cruise ship visit that they can't discharge anything within 12 miles of the coast. And that's much more stringent than state or federal standards. So they, they store it on board and process it um, further out at sea, or, you know, and they do have processing systems that that take care of that. Um, as far as monitoring it, um, we don't have that kind of equipment, but Channel Keeper does have, keep a close eye on the cruise ship portion of our business. Okay, are we, are we good? Uh, Mr. Kwan, do we need a, a motion to approve the budget? Or was it a hearing? No, Mr. Madam Mayor. Yep, just information. If you had anything you wanted us to be prepared to bring back, or uh, otherwise we're ready to move on to airport. Uh, let me close with a question. Did the Chumash Maritime Association um, give us a request to uh, have the fees waived for their tamol? Their, um... Madam Mayor, I've heard nothing further on that since okay. your last outgoing email. And... Um, they have not applied for, we were talking this morning about Visit Santa Barbara, applying for this, yeah. We can follow up outside yeah. of this hearing, thanks. But Mr. I've Dominguez, I'm sorry, did you, okay, Mr. Dominguez? Are we past public comment on to just general comments? Yes, okay. open mic for us <laughs> at this point, yeah, go for it. I'm assuming that's because there's only city staff in the audience and no public, is that? or just no slips were submitted. That's right. So I guess on that note, one, I'd encourage anyone watching who wanted to, uh, to comment on any of the bu budget workshops to please comment, either come into our meetings and engage or call us, email us beyond those who already have. But we want the public to be very engaged on any and all departments activities. Um, speaking about this particular department, I just wanted to say that I've, I found it to be very well run and I appreciate the, the efforts of, of management and staff to uh, keep this a well-run department and have a clean and safe waterfront. It's, it's an, you know, our, our shining gem, so thank you for doing that. I noticed there's several new P3s in here, and that's great. I'm glad that you, you were engaged and are uh, self-monitoring what you can do better and, and keeping track of all these things. 
The only thing I, I would add in, if you're interested, would be something related to the parking lots and just the, the safety of those, just because that's always a concern. Um, and what was the other thing I was gonna mention? In terms of, of kind of your mission, I notice in here, special event supported 300. You talked about you know balancing the, uh, the marine activities. Are there any trends you're noticing in waterfronts and other areas? Are there any trends that you're trying to, to follow in terms of shifting usage or increasing usage or decreasing usage that isn't as economically, recreational, or environmentally sound? Or what's, what are we looking at from the waterfront department for the next couple of years in terms of what you're trying to foment? Well, uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, uh, as Council Member Snedden mentioned, it, we have an extremely stable tenant base and we're 100% occupied on, in the slips and on the land and on, and on the wharf. And we have very little t tenant turnover. I think in t the 20 years I've been doing property management down there, I think I've had two evictions, one which was for failure to pay and the other was for failure to behave. So um, it's, it's very stable. People will buy a business out and the business often will continue on. For instance, right now, the Conway wine tasting room, if you or into that and you haven't been there, it's a wonderful place. They're going, going to be going through an expansion shortly. Um, so I, you know, we're very lucky compared to the harbors to the south of us, Channel Islands and Ventura, in terms of our business, our mix of commercial fishing, which I think adds a lot to the charm of what people come down there for. And uh, I don't see any trend. I think we're the, we're doing pretty well. I think we're kind of leading the pack on that. As Brian mentioned, uh, a number, well, the marinas south of us particularly have vacancy problems rather than our problem, which is everybody wants to be here. So it's kind of a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it situation? That's how I'd look at it. Okay, great. Thank you. And Mayor Mario, uh, Council Member Dominguez, one other thing. Every five years, as per our Harbor Master Plan, we go through and analyze the uses, um, changes over those five years things we want to do moving forward. So we, we do go back. I mean, we're always looking at this, but as Scott said, we're kind of more of an example at this point. But every five years, we do go through that process, and I think that's come. Zoning, yeah. It's a zoning requirement. Um, and so we do that every five years. I think it's coming up in, in sometime in late 19. So, you, And you'll see us as part of that, as part of that process and use analysis and th things like that. Okay. Congratulations on your well-run department. And Mr. Casey, thank you for starting us off with a department that's doing so well budget-wise. And thanks, uh, Waterfront staff. Is the airport up next? Very good. Ms. Johns, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Hazel Johns, the airport director. And with me today, um, I'd like to introduce the managers at the airport. Uh, first, um, Aaron Keller is our most recent manager. He joined us from Portland, Maine, and he's our operations manager. Uh, sitting next to him is Deanna Zacherson. She's our business and property manager, management I can't remember your business development manager. And then, of course, um, on the left is Jeff McKee. He's our facilities manager, uh, taking care of all the properties, both um, on the airfield and our buildings. Um, unlike <clears throat> Scott, I have done the budget for so many years that uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Tom Bullers uh, to lead you through our process. Thank you. Mr. Bullers. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council Members. I'm here to talk about the airport's fiscal year 2019 recommended budget. So just a quick outline of our presentation. We'll talk about the airport generally, um, dive into our uh, changes to our fiscal year 19 plan. Those are changes from our uh, two-year budget. Uh, then look at our cash flow projections for the operating fund over the next five years. 
and then talk about some key initiatives and performance objectives that we have. So like the waterfront, uh, we are an enterprise fund, self-sustaining. Um, we don't receive any general fund subsidies. We receive a lot of revenues from uh, tenant rents and, and user fees. Uh, we are a, an FAA certificated airport. Uh, so with that comes a lot of regulations from the TSA and FAA uh, related to uh, firefighting, security, uh, maintenance and repair, et cetera. So just a brief organizational chart. Again, you can see uh, this aligns with uh, the managers you see sitting here, business properties of Deanna. Uh, that includes parking and marketing. Airport operations include security and certification and operations. And the facilities planning and development group uh, plans and constructs our capital projects. And then finally, facilities maintenance is uh, broken into a few different groups, including uh, airport custodial air operations area. We refer to that as the AOA. That's generally the, the property within the, the fence around the airport. And then landscape maintenance. Mm -hmm. From a staffing perspective, uh, FY18, we have 61 employees. The FY19 budget uh, includes a request to add two positions, two FTEs in the certification and operations division. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, you can see from this chart that the bulk of the airport employees are in the maintenance, security, and certification and operations divisions. We also contract with the fire department for nine uh, firefighters and the public works department for two public uh, engineers. So just kind of a, a high level summary of our total budget. Uh, the, the airport fund um, makes up the bulk of our, our budget, uh, almost 90%. And then we have some smaller dedicated funds that make up uh, smaller uh, totals. In terms of our appropriations by division, um, the item that stands out here is the administration uh, division. That division um, makes payments for debt service on the terminal, uh, grant grants, um, allocated costs. So it, it bears a lot of the department-wide costs that, uh, that add up to some significant dollars. I'll also note in the bottom right here, um, that page refers to uh, the budget book, so if you did want to follow along in your budget book. So our proposed changes, some of our key budget changes. Um, we've talked about this for a number of years now, the 495 um, South Fairview facility. Um, it's a, a very large hangar facility that actually um, comes back to the airport this week. Um, it's a very very large facility. Um, it's going to have some challenges, but also some really big revenue opportunities for us. Um, so we're proposing to add $50,000 above the status quo for um, maintenance for that facility, so HVAC, elevators, et cetera. We're also at, uh, proposing to add $60,000 for electrical costs. Um, those tenants use electricity, so we have to pay those costs. One of our other big um, upcoming projects is um, bidding the, the FBO uh, leases. Uh, so we're looking to add $60,000 to hire a, a consultant to help us with that bidding process. And will you explain what that is for the public who doesn't know sure. FBO? Yes, Madam Mayor and Council, uh, FBO stands for Fixed Base Operator. And, and generally it's a service station for airplanes. They provide fuel storage, maintenance, um, in storage inside and outside. So it's a, a company that services aircraft operations. Private aircraft, right? Private oh. aircraft, okay. yes. Thanks, mm -hmm. thank you. We're also looking to add some uh, funds for overtime in our security and cert certification and operations division. This um, would bring it in line with uh, more like the three-year average uh, overtime costs. We recently installed some new parking revenue control equipment. So this would be uh, 40, about $47,000 to uh, for preventive maintenance for that equipment. And then just a little bit about our ground transportation program. So um, the ground transportation program was revised last summer to include prearranged operators. So things like Uber and Lyft, that was one of the big changes that we made to our program. The original two-year budget envisioned enforcement by our parking management uh, contractor.
but we're instead uh, looking to do that with airport staff. Um, so by doing that, we'll, we'll save about $109,000. Uh, we envision having that program fully implemented um, in, in October, so generating about nine months of revenue or $134,000. So that kind of feeds into um, some of our proposed staffing changes. So the first item here um, is a reclassification of a current position that we have. Um, that position would uh, really focus on implementing the ground transportation at the terminal. Um, so that, that net cost is the, the increase in salary for that reclassification, uh, just about $6,400. And then these other two positions, the airport operations specialist and the senior airport operations specialist, that's to um, really staff um, our certif operations and certification division um, on a 24-7 basis. So the total cost for all of those positions, the two new positions and the reclassification uh, would be about just a little under $180,000. So then just looking at our uh, proposed expenditures, I'm just gonna talk real quick about the left-hand column. Uh, the airport fund is kind of made up of uh, some sub funds. So from the salaries and benefits down to appropriated reserve, we would um, call that our airport operating fund. That's the bulk of the airport's expenditures and really funds most of the airport's um, ongoing operations. Uh, within those categories, you see the special projects line at the airport. That really, uh, most of that is made up of the uh, parking shuttle to long-term parking lot two. Uh, moving down, the non-FAA capital fund is uh, capital that's not FAA grant funded. The development fund um, was uh, created when we sold uh, land of direct relief and, uh, with the purpose of building commercial industrial uh, development at the airport. And then the T hangar fund uh, was a state loan that was used to build uh, 24 T hangers on the airport. Um, so those T hangers generate revenue and pay back the state loan. So just highlight a few of the big changes uh, that we have. Um, in FY18, we anticipate about 4.5% uh, vacancy savings. It's a little less than the last few years. We've been closer to about 7% the last few years. And in terms of uh, staffing, overall, our staffing changes with the new positions, uh, the increases to overtime, uh, an increase about $337,000. In the supplies and services, um, again, the, the maintenance and electrical costs for the 495 South Fairview building, uh, the FBO consultant, the equipment maintenance, and, uh, and a little bit of savings from the ground transportation program, all kind of uh, roll together to a, an impact of about $334,000. Uh, you'll notice in fiscal year 2018, uh, the budget is, is similar to the FY19, but uh, we project to have um, significant savings there. We uh, budgeted for about five months of shuttle operations. They only operated for two months around the holiday season, around Thanksgiving through New Year's. So um, we'll realize some, some significant savings there. And then the overall impact, uh, about an $800,000 um, increase across all of those items. For our capital grants fund, um, again, this is kind of a breakdown of our passenger facility charge fund. So that is um, a fee collected per employment on airline tickets, and it pays for a portion of the debt service on the airline terminal. Uh, FAA capital projects, those are our grant-funded capital projects, um, FAA grant-funded projects. Um, within that item, you'll notice that there's zero dollars budgeted. So we typically budget for the grant match. The FAA doesn't award grants usually until the summer of any given year. So we usually return to council July or August to appropriate funds when we receive the grant. And then the facility charges, um, that is a, a customer facility charge. It's a fee on uh, airport rental car contracts. Uh, that um, pays for uh, the city loan that was used to construct the rental car quick turn facility. And then an item of note here, it looks like there's a big jump from projected FY18 to FY19. 
Um, so we budget a really significant appropriated reserve in this fund. It's close to $500,000. So um, when FY19 settles out, it'll be about similar to FY18 numbers. On the revenue side, we have some really significant changes um, in, in the general aviation um, side of the airport. The, the 495 South Fairview lease, uh, we anticipate generating about $1.8 million in FY 2019. And then the FBO leases, um, Hazel talked about for a minute there. Um, we extended those for two years um, well, we kind of worked through the process of, of the RFP, um, but the two current incumbents uh, had their rent increase 25 and 50%, so uh, during that two-year period. Our commercial industrial uh, revenues are, are pretty stable uh, for FY19 versus the current year. Our CFC fund revenues have been uh, very robust to the tune of about a $500,000 surplus a year um, so we anticipate being able to retire that debt around fiscal year 2020. And then one of the other drivers of our revenues at the airport is uh, air service and passengers. Um, passengers park, they rent cars, they go to the restaurant, um, but they also, uh, air service includes the size of the plane. So bigger planes pay higher landing fees, um, take on more fuel, et cetera. Mr. Rouse has a question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It said FBO leases increased by 25 and 50 percent. Would you explain that to me, please? That seems like a pretty phenomenal jump in a rent. Mayor uh, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> and uh, Councilman Rouse, uh, it is a, a large increase in rent. Um, however, the FBOs really haven't had an increase in uh, a number of years. And uh, while we're going through the master plan implementation for new facilities for the fixed space operators, moving uh, one uh, company from south of the airline terminal to the north side of the main runway, um, these two particular FBOs were very interested in remaining on the airport and not and going through that process with us. Um, based on the the limited space that we have for the uh, FBO on the south side of the terminal. They have a very small footprint. That's why their rent was only increased 25%, whereas the FBO that's on the north side that has over a million square feet of land and facilities, um, that one was increased 50%. Um, both FBOs, when engaged and um, we talked about the increases, they accepted them without comment. Good enough for me, thank you. So this is just a chart showing our historical employment. So an employment is um, simply a passenger boarding. Um, roughly you can double that and get the number of passengers in, in any given year. So uh, you can see um, just after the recession, uh, the airport's employments started going down very significantly. And, reach bottom in fiscal year 2016, but we've seen some um, pretty ro robust growth in FY17, 10%. Um, uh, in FY18, uh, we project about a 6% increase. Um, that's less than we had budgeted. We had budgeted closer to 13%. Um, there was two main reasons for that. So over the summer months, um, some of the airlines added some really significant capacity. Uh, for example, San Francisco added about uh, third, 33% capacity increase, but we only saw about a single digit increase in the number of passengers. Um, so it didn't, didn't really meet our expectations. And then in some of the winter months, some of the airlines uh, downsized aircraft. So um, Dallas-Fort Worth went from a, a mainline A319 aircraft, that's 128-seat aircraft, to a 76-seat aircraft. For fiscal year 2019, we anticipate about a 5% increase over FY18. Council Member Friedman. I, I recently uh, saw that there's some new uh, airlines went to Minneapolis, if I recall. Are these numbers uh, reflective of that new addition? Uh, uh, <laughs> Mayor Murillo and Councilman Friedman, uh, no, they're not because the announcements came after we had filed the budget. 
So the um, trip, the seasonal service by Sun Country Airlines from Santa Barbara to Minneapolis, uh, flying on Thursday and Sunday, will start this summer, but they were not included. And similarly, Frontier Airlines that are coming back to Santa Barbara with three daily flights, um, that also is not included. So our numbers could be, should be better than we're projecting. Do we have any just rough estimates of uh, the total numbers between those two uh, in addition? Council Member Friedman, uh, I would estimate about 5,000 passengers a month um, for the two combined. They're both planning seasonal right now, seasonal service. So um, on an annualized basis, we'll see if they wind up extending beyond seasonal and go full year with their service or keep it seasonal. Okay. So switching over to our uh, revenues, um, just again, a brief description of the column on the left-hand side. Commercial industrial, that's, that's our commercial industrial property, mostly north of Hollister, um, generates um, almost $4.8 million in, in annual rent. Um, Non-commercial aviation is uh, aviation that's not commercial airlines. So again, that would be like general aviation um, for building rentals, landing fees, uh, fuel flowage. Terminal, terminal rents include parking, rental cars, the restaurant concession. Commercial aviation, um, our charges charge the commercial airlines. So that is for terminal rental, landing fees, fuel flowage. And then again, the development fund and T-Hanger fund um, have their own revenues that they generate. So just to highlight a few items here, FY18, um, this is an anomaly that FY18 projected would be higher than the FY19, but uh, we received some reimbursement from one of our tenants who uh, vacated some property. They reimbursed us for some um, improvements that we had to make after they vacated the property. Overall, we're recommending um, a, a, a decrease of about $136,000. Um, the 6100 Hollister Avenue development had some delays in um, completion. Um, in terms of our terminal rentals, um, this is uh, driven by passengers a lot. So uh, since we're seeing fewer passengers versus what we had originally planned, we're uh, recommending a reduction of almost $80,000 there. And then just to highlight the FY19 recommended versus uh, fiscal year 2018 projected, um, we, we are seeing a passenger increase. So it's not just a 2% sort of um, cost of living increase that we're seeing in that category. And also we'll see um, nine months of revenues from the ground transportation program there. On the commercial aviation side, uh, we're, we're recommending a decrease of about $91,000. Uh, we've seen some decreased fuel sales to the commercial airlines to the tune of about 25%. Um, what we've heard is that fuel prices are just cheaper in other places, so they're taking on fuel in Dallas or Denver and flying to Santa Barbara with a, a, a fuller tank of fuel on the aircraft. Interest going up uh, almost $90,000. Again, it's a, a positive interest rate environment. Uh, we have a $79,000 decrease here in other, so uh, the TSA reimburses the airport for um, law enforcement officers. Uh, when we put together the budget, um, it looked like the LEO reimbursement program might be cut by the federal government. Uh, the omnibus appropriation that was passed in, I think it was April, actually funded the TSA program and put it back in. Um, so we'll, we should see some... Um, some upside there for the, at least the first three months of the year. We'll see what happens after October 1st. In the development fund, we have um, sort of some cross uh, currents going on here. So the overall impact is about a $17,000 decrease. Um, interest rates are going up, but again, with delays to the 6100 Hollister Avenue development, there's no uh, rental income from that development versus what we had originally planned.
and then again looking at the the other funds uh, the FAA capital projects again will return to council uh, for revenue appropriations when we receive the grant and then moving into our cash flow projections um, so last week we talked a little bit about a possible loan from the city for two buildings um, so what we're including some assumptions that that, that loan would happen. Um, so to construct 9,400 square feet, $3.1 million loan uh, at a 3.5% interest rate over a nine-year term, um, and then incorporating these assumptions into the, the airport operating fund and kind of the long-term impacts on that. So looking out ahead, um, you can see there at the bottom line, um, pretty sizable increases year to year as we receive some um, sizable increases one of those is uh, the auto dealership so this is at 6200 Hollister Avenue this uh, dealership is currently under development so we anticipate uh, receiving revenues and starting FY 2020 uh, that would be about three hundred twenty five thousand dollars annually for the airport and then the Hollister Avenue development um, the the development fund would essentially to pay back the the loan from the city would use all of the revenues to, to pay back in the first few years. Um, so the, the, the excess that the development fund wouldn't start generating to go to the operating fund wouldn't occur until fiscal year 22. So uh, a very modest $7,500 in fiscal year 2022. And then the 495 um, in the non-commercial aviation category, the 495 South Fairview um, property is going to generate a lot of money in, F in FY19, but some additional funds in FY2020. And then just looking uh, quickly at the, the operating, uh, the expenditure side of um, the development fund um, would receive a small subsidy from the airport operating fund in that first year. Uh, so a little over sixteen thousand uh, dollars would be neutral overall in 2021, and then um, from the previous slides, a, a touch of revenue to the operating fund in fiscal year 2022. The overall uh, impact on the airport. So in fiscal year 2019 or 18, uh, we're looking at about a 1.1 million dollar use of reserves. Um, coming into the fiscal year, we had about 1.5 million dollars in reserves above policy balanced budget for uh, FY 2019 and then we start seeing some really uh, positive surpluses uh, heading into the future 2020 through 2022. And then in terms of the, that bottom line and its impacts on uh, the airport operating fund year-end reserves, um, with the, the big reserve uh, that the airport had coming into fiscal year 2018 and, and the use of reserves, uh, we would see the airport about even with uh, reserves at policy. At the end of FY19, uh, that shows uh, almost a $200,000 reserve below policy. Uh, however, we feel pretty confident that we'd be able to achieve savings throughout the year, uh, especially in, in salary and benefits where we typically see uh, at least 4% savings annually. So that would more than make up that $200,000 below policy as the year goes on. And then in the out years, um, some really solid reserves above policy. So this is just a quick look at some of our other funds, um, positive uh, reserves in the capital fund. Uh, the development fund has earned some interest over the past uh, year plus. Uh, the FAA grants and capital fund is um, awaiting some, some reimbursements from the federal government. Uh, the passenger facility charge uh, has a very robust $3.1 million. Uh, so last week we talked a little bit about refinancing our terminal debt. So we might be able to pay down a portion of that debt with this $3.1 million and um, realize some longer term savings as part of that refinancing. And then the cu customer facility charge, $2.5 million um, in reserves. This is the fund that's been generating about $500,000 annually and should be able to pay off the loan. Uh, in the next few years. And then finally, just a modest positive balance for the T Anger Fund. So moving on to some of our uh, work objectives. So just wanted to highlight a few across uh, the airport. 
Uh, the 495 South Fairview uh, building is uh, very important for the airport, so um, managing a smooth transition to the airport's ownership and making sure the electrical repairs are done in a timely manner and um, everything we need to have that facility operating smoothly is in place. 6100 Hollister Avenue, um, another important airport development, so we want to make sure we have a marketing plan to get those buildings leased up, um, hopefully before the buildings are completed. And um, Redesigning our, our airport's website. And again, 495 South Fairview, getting those preventive maintenance contracts in place. Uh, repainting our runway center lines twice. And then in our security group, uh, reviewing our field training manual and, and revising as we need to. For the certification and operations group, again, this is to really implement that program, our new ground transportation program, to start um, assessing fees to the, the transportation network companies. In our facilities planning group, uh, completing a draft of the industrial area specific plan update and also completing construction of the 6100 Hollister Avenue development. In terms of our capital projects for next fiscal year, um, our grant match is about uh, a little over 9% of the, the FAA grant, so we anticipate about $264,000. Um, and those, the projects associated with that would be a replacement of one of our ARF vehicles, that's aircraft rescue and firefighting vehicles. Those are about $800,000. And then about $2 million uh, for um, replacement of some of the pavement outside of the 495 South Fairview hangars. Lessee building maintenance. These are uh, buildings. We have, the airport has a lot of buildings, 50-odd uh, buildings, and they have a, they're have they old and just need repairs. So um, we're looking at building 344, uh, doing some exterior improvements there. Uh, replacing the HVAC in our airfield electrical vault. Uh, 495 South Fairview hangar, um, we're going to have a much better idea in a couple days of exactly what we need to do there, but we wanted to have some money available. Uh, we know we're going to need to make some significant investments there, so $200,000 will um, give us a good, good boost on that front. Street maintenance, uh, we're looking to um, repave the long-term terminal parking lot. Uh, the industrial area specific plan update that um, was last updated in, I think 2003, 98, so it's about time to be updated. Um, AOA maintenance and, and utility infrastructure, that's just sort of ongoing maintenance of um, pavement in the AOA and, and airport water, sewer lines, et cetera. And then at the airline terminal, we're looking to um, add some passenger railings, or not passenger railings, railings on top of the boarding bridges, and that's really a, a safety item for um, maintenance workers as they're on top of those buildings. Finally, uh, in March, the airport commission recommended uh, approval of the airport's FY 2019 budget. And with that, we'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for our airport staff? Um, let me ask if um, you have tenants already lined up for 495 South Fairview, or is there'll be some old tenants and some new? Mayor uh, Mario, that's exactly right. We have extended lease proposals to um, two of the fixed base operators to uh, use the uh, majority of the hangar for aircraft storage for uh, transient aircraft that might uh, come and go in Santa Barbara. Hmm. Additionally, f uh, Federal Express ground uh, distribution, the air cargo portion, uh, we've extended uh, a lease proposal to them as well. Um, and then of course, Ms. McCaw has one portion of the hangar. Okay, very good. Uh, Mr. Hart and then Mr. Dominguez. I don't actually have any questions. Just wanted to offer congratulations. It's a really spectacular change in the financial picture at the airport. And I know it's not an accident. It's by your hard work of all your team. Um, the additional airlines coming into town are fabulous. And just, you know, it was really your perseverance through different difficult economic times that have turned the ship around or the plane around in this instance. <laughs> and um, you just deserve a lot of credit and thanks. And, and it's really remarkable seeing the difference. 
Thank you. Mr. Dominguez? Thank you. The um, two questions about the uh, P3s in the administration section accomplished 75% of the department's program objectives and you had in, you had adopted in 2018, 85%. So I'm curious why that's dropped from meeting 85% of your objectives to 75%. Um, Mayor Murillo and, and uh, Councilman Dominguez, um, our airport patrol division has numerous uh, P3s to be met. And as you probably are aware, we've been short staffed over uh, a period of time with patrol officers. So we weren't able to meet those uh, particular uh, benchmarks. That's primarily the, the uh, area where we fell short. And so um, let me see if I understand is, so it's 75% of all these individual P3s or what, what exactly? The whole department, yes. So, and I noticed there were four out of the six airport security. Are those the ones you're referencing? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so is that about 10% of your P3s or how did you come up with 75% versus 85%? I'm, I'll have Tom. Council Member Dominguez, yeah, it was kind of just looking at the last few years and um, which of these security objectives that we've consistently not been meeting since we've been short staffed. Um, that calculation does um, include all of the department's project objectives and measurable, measurable objectives. So I think over the whole department, it's something like 55 total. Um, and, and a lot of these um, items within the security division are, are the the items that we've had struggles with meeting because of vacancies. So what, what can we do in the meantime to shore that up? It seems like security is one of your more important functions. Is there a temporary agency you can use? Can we bring over personnel from our PD? Uh, Mayor Murillo and, and Councilman Dominguez, actually, um, I'm feeling pretty confident right now that um, I should, I'm going to knock on wood here, that uh, we're going to fill those positions in, in patrol. Right now, I believe we have one vacancy. Uh, our staff has just gone through interviews with um, at least 10 individuals, and uh, we plan to put three of those candidates through the background check just to see if they succeed. And so hopefully from that batch, we'll have full staff back. But it has taken, as the PD uh, has the same issue. I mean, it's taken a long time to get staffing back up in place. And I think that uh, with that, we'll be able to meet most of our objectives. And we're also working with our security division to reanalyze the P3s and just how many of those do they actually need to have um, and looking at the program overall. Well, I, I would be... Uh definitely in favor of, of looking at the numbers to make sure they're in line with uh, other airports and with what security consultants and specialists say. I wouldn't want to drop them just so we can meet them. I'm also concerned uh, in general that we would drop the, the 85 to 75 percent, particularly if you're optimistic that we can meet these next year. So given your optimism, could we restore the proposed 2019 to 85%? Or if you don't think that's wise, what can we as a council do to support your department so we do achieve those security goals? Because obviously it would be devastating if something were to happen as a result of our not meeting these goals. One of the um, um, benefits of having uh, the ARF unit or the firefighters on the airfield um, has been when we can't make a, a, an inspection of all the gates, as an example, the vehicle gates or the pedestrian gates that surround the airport, uh, the um, ARF units have been able to go out and actually do that for us or to respond to uh, minor uh, incidents on the field, not crashes, but minor things that might happen when, when we don't have a patrol officer available. And the reason that we've had difficulty is TSA had required us over a period of time to ensure that we had an officer just standing in the um, screening area, just standing there in case there was an incident. 
um, while before that uh, requirement came down, that officer could be on patrol and be called back within three to five minutes. Um, with um, just recently, Aaron has worked with TSA to allow us to go back, to revert back to the three to five minute response, which will free up the patrol officers from that um, stanchion uh, in the uh, boarding or the screening checkpoint area. So I think with the changes with TSA and also with uh, more staff, I think we, we can uh, achieve better. And we can take a look, I think after July 1st, we have an opportunity to make changes to the proposed uh, P3s. And we'll take a look at that. And, and it looks like a lot of these are um, going to and being at different places. Is there a way we can provide transportation, like would another golf cart, would a Segway, or are these all only walkable? Walkable inside the terminal, but they have patrol vehicles that uh, are on the airfield uh, inside and outside uh, the airfield. So we have vehicles okay. for that. And are all of these areas under camera surveillance? The majority are under camera. Yes, we do have a couple of locations that are not, but the majority are. So the daily or the uh, ramp inspections, those ramps are under camera uh, surveillance? Ramps or physical inspection, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Mr. Friedman. I, I just uh, had a, first I want to echo Councilman Hart's uh, observations and, and comments about the, the great work you're doing out there and the fact we have two more airlines coming in. It just uh, shows the turnaround we're having and the numbers are going back up. I did have a, maybe a clarification or just for my understanding it, on slide 10 and slide 12. So on slide 10, uh, page five in our packet, um, it has to do with the overtime. It's the overtime and security at 55,800. And then I was wondering, because we're on slide 12, we have the, the two new positions. And then you also mentioned that we're going to be filling another, uh, the 10th position. Do those, any of those three relate to the duties of the overtime that's being budgeted? Or is that a completely separate position? And my, my question is, if we're having these three positions, do we really need the $55,000 in overtime? <laughs> Mayor Murillo and, and Councilman Friedman, initially, yes, we do, um, because while we're asking for two new positions in certification and ops, those positions will be effective July 1st. By the time we go through the, the uh, recruitment process, we probably, if we're lucky, would have them on staff by maybe November. So in that interim period, we still need to cover 24-7, and that's why the, the overtime is there. So in, the, in future budgets, then, we could expect, hopefully, that the overtime costs would go down uh, because we'd have those positions filled? As long as we're full staff, overtime will be less. Thank still you. be there, but would be less, Thank yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. We don't have any other questions or comments or compliments, compliments to your department. Thank you very much. Mr. Casey, which department is next? Solid waste. Okay. So Mr. Samario and Ms. Eyerly will be presenting. Very good. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. I'm Bob Samari, the finance director, and I'm with um, Renee Irely. She is our environmental services manager. And I um, wanted just to point out a couple things. One, the, the solid waste fund is managed by the environmental services division. That's one of six divisions within the finance department. 10 years ago, the environmental services was shifted from public works to finance on a temporary basis, and that has now become permanent, obviously. I don't see any signs of it going back. Um, Obviously, you know, we, we do a lot of things in environmental services and they're much different than we do in finance traditionally, but I really enjoyed having them in our department even as, as much as they've taken a lot of my time. I, I enjoy what they do and they do a lot of great things. 
Today we're going to focus, of course we're going to look at the numbers, but we're going to really focus a lot on the programmatic side of things. You know, you've been hearing a lot about the resource recovery project has been, that's really dominating the conversation now about what we do, but we do a lot more than that. And so Ms. Eyerly is going to touch on some of the things we do to help keep the city clean. I think they're really great things that we do, and I just think it's a good opportunity for you to hear all those things. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, yeah, so um, today I'll be starting off with a brief overview of the solid waste um, management system itself and how it functions currently. And um, related to that, how our division is organized and um, providing additional uh, program and services to the community. Um, then I'll follow up with our proposed budget overview and a few of our key performance objectives for fiscal year 2019. So the overarching reason for having a solid waste management system at all is um, really twofold. One is to protect public health, obviously, and the second, um, at least since the late 1980s, is to meet or exceed a state and federal regulations regarding diversion and landfill management. The chart in front of you is a system overview um, of our infrastructure and how the materials flow through this. Um, so what a material is, whether it's trash, recycling, food scraps, or green waste, determines how it's collected, where it's processed, and its final disposition. The materials on this chart, it is a lot of information, um, is really read by column from top to bottom, um, color-coded. So for trash, um, this is across the board, whether it's residential or commercial. Um, is collected, it's taken to the, the transfer station run by the the county is consolidated and taken to the Tahikwas landfill. For recycling, depending on whether it's collected by a dumpster or a cart, it's either, if a dumpster, taken first to the David Love facility located at the airport, which is operated by Marburg and processed. If it's a cart, it's taken to the transfer station, again, where it's consolidated and then, then taken to Gold Coast Recycling, which is down in Ventura County. And with that, it is also processed. These are then um, bundled by commodity and type, and they are shipped to the port of Long Beach, where they are marketed and uh, sold and shipped largely overseas. For food scraps, for the commercial system only, that's this um, service we do provide to commercial services. Again, it goes to the transfer station where it's consolidated, and then it's sent to Agriman down in Oxnard. This is a new contract we've had with them for a little over a year. And they um, screen and process this material where it's composted over a 45-day process. And comp uh, Agriman's a fairly large um, business producer, and they have material that they bring in from um, really all over the West Coast. And uh, it is mixed with other soil amendments and um, marketed as one of 200 different products at the retail level. And then finally, green waste, which is open to all customers, but it's uh, largely a residential um, uh, service that's offered, um, some apartment buildings as well and commercial. And that, again, is taken through the transfer station, um, then to the county where it is um, mulched and it is available to residents for free for pickup, um, and or there's some additional processing that they handle for um, screening, and it's available for a small per ton fee. And um, finally, the county disposes of most of the mulch um, to um, orchards and, and other like, ranchers around, uh, around the county. And this is a, just a, a, a map of where all of these uh, facilities currently reside. Um, so you can get a sense of, of where everything is being shipped to that I just described. And then this is a chart of uh, if, um, the trends in our program over um, really the last um, uh, 15 years. And as you can see, we have a very mature program, um, very good participation and diversion, and the only real major change in collection was the addition of commercial food scraps in 2009, which is that yellow line at, at the bottom of the chart. 
Um, the top line is uh, our over total um, processing and, and collection of material. We are starting to see a slight uptick to that, um, largely attributed to the Im um, improving economy in the area. And for the Environmental Service Division overall, uh, we manage the solid waste collection, processing, and disposal for the entire system, residential, commercial, and city facility operations. So this includes the service del delivery component, which is the lion's share, um, about 88% of um, the, the revenue requirements that we have. And this is contracted out to Marburg, Agriman, and then uh, the county services, which include household hazardous waste, the green waste um, processing, and some other educational services they provide to us. On the program delivery component side, we oversee the waste reduction programming, education, enforcement, and then any new program and policy development for the city. So today, um, as I said, around service delivery. This comprises managing all of those contracts and the oversight of their provisions, financial management, data collection, and due diligence around um, rate, se rate setting and the management of the fund itself. Um, but I'll be spending more time today actually talking about the program um, elements um, on the fo in the following slides. So in particular today, I wanted to talk about some of the waste re reduction and recovery programming that we've been working on in the past year. And then a whole host of projects that sort of fall under the umbrella of cleaning the community. And we've been working um, under sort of the, a working title of calling it the Clean SB because there, there's so many of them now and there's an opportunity to, to get them to, to work together and to synergize. And then some of our communication and education. So around waste for organic, um, waste reduction, um, we obviously are working both on recycling and organics, but there is a lot of um, push at the state and now federal level to, to focus on organics in particular. So that has been our focus for the last couple of years around services provided. So what you see here is a f the, it's called the food recovery hierarchy. And it is, um, an update that EPA um, has developed as a corollary to the, the hierarchy that they developed in 1990 around reduce, reuse, recycling, sort of um, across the board. And part of that reason is that food waste is the largest component left in municipal waste. It's about 18% um, in trash. And landfills are the largest source of methane in the US, and so obviously that's been the big driver um, to get it out of landfills overall. So um, if you look at the, at the chart, and it's, it starts really with uh, source reduction and reuse um, and including um, sort of food recovery and rescue. And the reason that EPA has kept those at the top of the hierarchy as the preferred strategies um, is because they use less um, natural resources. They can be less expensive. Um, the way you get at them is through project product redesign, um, uh, less packaging, um, donation, bulk purchases, those sorts of things. And so um, they're also the toughest to implement precisely for all of those reasons as well. But certainly they are you know, an important component in the, the quiver of addressing um, diversion. So as of 2018, here in the city, our program is diverting about 3,200 tons from the landfill each year on average, um, which if you're um, sort of like looking for a comparable, that is uh, about 19 and a half million apples. So I don't know if that helps with the visual or not, but <laughs> it's a lot. Um, currently, we have over 230 members um, enrolled in our food scraps composting program. Membership includes restaurants, office spaces, schools, grocery stores, and hospitals. Um, we provide an all-inclusive program, 
It works directly um, with individual business managers and owners uh, through our technical assistance program. Our staff is bilingual, so we also train kitchen and janitorial staff and, um, and all of the staff at the, um, that work in these in, um, institutions and organizations. Um, and it's, having the bilingual program has been really um, part of the success. Our staff also makes random contamination checks to ensure that it's being executed correctly. So we also operate one of the most robust food scrap composting programs in the region. And Cal Recycle, who's our state regulatory body, um, uses it as a model program for other jurisdictions that they're trying to bring along and, and bring into compliance. So this is an example of an ideal set out. Um, it actually comes from one of the elementary schools that we work with, um, and it's, it's an aspiration for all. Um, our, our program accepts both food and soiled paper products. Clear bags are OK, as you can see on the left. Um, and as a large and mature uh, composting program, we do face a fair amount of um, challenges like contamination. We run at about a 15% contamination rate, um, which is fairly um, typical for a program like that we run, particularly since we collect both pre- and post-consumer food. It's much easier to keep contamination down to you know, the, the low single digits if you're only collecting from the kitchens themselves, not from um, consumers who've used it out, who have eaten and then are throwing things away. This is an example of one of our excelling schools, Franklin Elementary. Um, all but one of the schools so far in Santa Barbara School District are um, participating in the program. Um, our office worked also with the school district's um, kitchen management to encourage them to purchase compostable plates, trays, and bowls district-wide. Um, Franklin School has a full suite of recycling and uh, composting program um, at their school. They also oper operate the largest um, kitchen uh, and cafeteria in, this, in the school district itself. So it's really um, quite impressive that they're doing so well. And then finally, this is just an example of Belmont El um, Encanto Health Hotel. They are um, an example of a facility that is uh, not only working the program incredibly well, um, at their facility here um, and have been requesting that we bring in and, and do um, re um, regular trainings and updates to, to their staff, but their regional manager is using it as an example to uh, spread out to all of the, the Belmont um, properties um, throughout the Western region. And then Clean um, Santa Barbara. As I said, this is a working title for a whole suite of programs that we have either um, been administrating or initiated this year or, or even expanded this year. And that includes abandoned waste and bulky items, litter, public containers, homeless encampments, um, code enforcement, and education associated with those as well. So another... Um, element that we get um, asked a lot about is how clean is our community? Um, so around abandoned waste and bulky items, for example, um, we had a big change to address this, um, this issue involving consolidating Marburg's role in handling calls for bulky item and abandoned waste um, collection, um, increased um, code enforcement presence in their hot um, spot areas, a marketing campaign to increase awareness of bulky item service and um, how to report illegal dumping when someone sees it happening. And then piloting modes of reducing abandoned waste, um, including a bulky item drop off during our annual cleanup, which occurs in October, a curbside collection event, which we piloted in the Lower West Side um, just in April um, in, a, in a defined area. Um, we have started this month piloting roving trucks in some of the hot spot areas down on, on in the west and east side. And 
Coming up in June, we'll be also doing a, a postcard citywide reminding residents of the free annual pickup that they can take advantage of. So is illegal dumping increasing or increasing? It's a good question. Um, we've increased the, our data collection and monitoring for the program this year, and we have correlated information that looks promising, um, but we do still need more information. So as you can see over time, over the last four years, the number of scheduled pickups has consistently increased. So items dumped had been increasing, but we did show a reduction this year in 2017. So both of these trends may be due to the increased um, outreach messaging and presence um, in some of the, the, the more challenging areas in town. Um, but we do need, as I said, more information to really be seen what, um, what kind of trend this is and to try to correlate some of that information more strongly back to the, to the work that we're doing. So as I said, code enforcement is not just for, uh, it's not just for abandoned waste, but it has been our focus this year. Excuse me. And we have had an enhanced presence, um, both patrolling in, again, some of the more challenging areas, but also having our code enforcement take the opportunity to, to do on-the-spot education um, as she is out in these areas. We've also started adding signage in some of the hot spots based on um, a couple of pilots that we also did this year. So we're in the process of, of putting up about 130 of these signs throughout, throughout the area in our hot spots. The first installation, which we consider uh, the, hot, um, the pilot, was on Euclid Avenue, and it was um, actually as part of a bigger request in working with that neighborhood um, on several issues. And we are, we, again, we are seeing a direct correlation to a reduced um, amount of abandoned waste in that area. And it occurred after, after the signage. And so, um, you know, we are curious about whether it, it, it's showing that there's an increased interest in the area, and so it makes the, the area less desirable. But it's certainly one of the, the elements that we're, we're investigating. And while large items typically get noticed and reported, litter and small items usually go unreported for the most part. You know, this is bottles, cans, chip bags, cigarette butts, all that, all this good, good stuff. Um, so this year we, we ramped up um, some cleanup efforts on litter. We've had a volunteer program, which I'll talk more about in a second. Um, but we also piloted using um, Big Green to clean up some hot spots on the east and west side as well as part of our Looking Good Santa Barbara program. Um, and then we also run a student fundraising program, which allows them to go out and, and do cleanup projects and receive a small stipend. And so we had them focus on litter cleanups as well this year. And we had um, 12 youth groups participate in that. We also continue to work closely with streets and traffic on this issue um, and how to, again, like to monitor and best address it. and public containers. Um, the city does have a master plan to address the upkeep and replacement of the containers. This was a first, these are befores, obviously, these are afters, we'll focus on those. Um, this was the first full year of operation. Um, there are over 1,400 of them in the city, and all of them are cataloged. And we are in the process of, this is the first full year of, of tackling at least 100 of them a year, and they are either um, uh, refurbished or replaced um, and repaired as, as needed. And so we have focused on three main areas, um, San Andreas, um, Milpas, and State Streets, and we are um, rolling this program out um, as we speak. And then with the addition of about $20,000 to our budget rather um, than coming out of the general fund, a new effort was established this year to address homeless camp cleanups in neighborhoods and along Highway 101. Um, it's a highly coordinated effort um, in the city with the police department, the lead on identification of areas, um, notification, 
and then the day of oversight on areas that, that need to be addressed. We manage, our, we manage contractor procurement um, and performance data collection and then communication among all parties, which also includes pulling in the Creeks Division and Caltrans. Um, we've had 32 encampments uh, cleaned to date, which is 50% more than last year um, with the same budget. We've collected 110 tons of um, trash from these areas so far. You say the partnership with Caltrans um, is vital um, and includes pooling resources to get the camps cleaned up in a timely manner and is proving to be very effective in addressing high priority reoccurring areas such as um, this Garden Street on and off ramps as you see here. And the county's involved with that as well, Ms. Ierly? Um, currently we, we have had a couple of occasions where there have been um, uh, coordination between whether it was on city or county property. Oh, okay. So, but for primarily, it's actually been Caltrans and, and to a lesser extent, um, UP as well. So, Thank you. Of course. And then finally, for the last 14 years, if you don't know about it, the, uh, we have had the Spirit of Service Awards, which recognizes the community um, going above and beyond to help reach our reduction and clean community goals. We've um, had approximately 85 awards um, given out since the program began, and through it, we hope to inspire others into action. And this year's award program is this Wednesday, May 9th. So around media and education, and we have a really also robust program that supports all of the division's work. Um, there are three major themes in our communication and education this year centered on waste reduction, recyclables contamination, and then the, the clean community, clean SB services. With the Save the Food campaign, nationally, carded food costs consumers and, in, and industry about $162 billion each year and 42, nationally, and 40% of it is edible food, which is never cooked or removed from packaging, just ends up in the garbage. So the Ad Council and the Natural Resources Defense um, Council had come up with this um, ad campaign to increase awareness about the economic and environmental um, impacts of discarding food that is edible and providing demonstrable activities that individu individuals can do. So we are taking advantage of this ad campaign that's already designed and we're able to brand with the city of um, Santa Barbara and um, use here in our community. The initial rollout on, to the, on the right is a, um, some signage that was up at the Earth Day Festival. And then we have a series of ads that started coming out this past week. And one of our primary goals also was to increase the presence on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So that success is measured in conversation, shares, and other interactions with our outreach team. And here are a couple of examples of the messaging on waste reduction. and then how to reduce contamination in recycling and food waste systems. So obviously um, there's a lot of focus on the markets right now generally, and the quality of recycling material can make a huge difference between what is in the end a marketable, marketable com commodity or a cart and bin that is now just full of trash. This is some of the examples of our high quality educational materials, brochures. These are chip clips in the middle um, to help keep your food fresh, uh, door hangers. And then we provide hands-on education in the community at public events sponsored by others um, and our own events, um, including our twice a year um, e-waste events, which are um, one of the largest in the state since 2007, we've collected over 2.7 million pounds of e-waste, and we average about 2,100 participants at each event. And as partnerships are vital to getting our work done and food rescue um, is an area um, of increasing interest, we have um, 
partnered with a CEC and also the Santa Barbara County Public Health Department in um, promoting so this idea to um, food retailers throughout, throughout the city. Um, and that is, on the right is a brochure that we are jointly um, developed to hand out to restaurants. And the health department is educating food retailers on both our food waste collection program and how to donate food to people in need. And we are jointly um, uh, distributing each other's information as we're out in the community. We've had a long-standing um, relationship with Explore Ecology. Um, they're one of the primary ways that we get into the school to work with students and educate them about um, our program and recycling and waste reduction through both classroom presentations and then also um, bringing students to Arts from Scrap to participate in programs. And new this year, uh, we are providing monthly um, presentations at Impact Hub. Um, it's, a, it's another way to work with the business um, community and residents and talk with them one-on-one -on -one about um, ways that they can um, you know, participate in our program and also get feedback from them about what's working and what's not working to, for them. And with that, we'll move on to the budget itself. Thank you. So as I said, overall, um, the lion's share of our expenditures um, are on hauler services. That does include the pass-through that goes for disposal as well, with over 80-80% um, of our expenditures. For this year, um, we've made some small adjustments. Um, as you can see from the amended budget to projected, our expenditures are, are generally um, tracking. Um, one of the um, more notable proposed adjustments is the line item around c um, county recycling subsidy. This um, is a, a cleanup. This is a, a, um, an expenditure that is now captured in the, in the tipping fee, and so going forward, it'll be reflected in the hauler services line item. In addition, around for special projects, we are, that $84,000 is a deferment of the utility system um, upgrade, and that is our um, contribution to that project. That's the last line. Go ahead. Up. To what project? Um, it's in the, the other line item, and that is a utility billing system okay. upgrade. Thank you. Regarding revenue, again, um, the line shares associated with solid waste fees, a little over 88%. And for, for this year, for the remainder of um, fiscal year 2018, around projected, the difference, the variance from the amended to the projected is primarily the result of changing the, the rates um, set for 2018. Initially, we were going to have a 5.3% a increase, and um, instead, the 2.1% was passed. And so there is um, a, about a 1.6% that is coming out of reserves um, to make up the, the difference to cover the expenditures. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, in our proposed adjustment with the recycling revenue line for Marburg, that's probably the most significant um, change in the decrease of revenue, and that is also tied directly to the recycling um, market and the, and the decrease in, in revenues and the reduction of revenues to share between the, um, the city and Marburg. Mr. Dominguez has a question. So I was speaking with someone in, in the waste business last week, and, and they had received some emails that uh, vendors were no longer receiving uh, paper, waste paper, and for the recycling. Have you heard anything about that? Thank you, Madam Mayor, um, Councilmember Dominguez. I have not heard that they have um, 
that anyone has completely refused um, paper as of yet. So um, I would be happy to try to find out some more information about that. But I've not had that, that communicated from any of our um, processors. Do you know, um, is that a big percentage of this line item? I would need to go back and and look at what the overall percentages are. I mean, they, they do tend to, to vary a bit. Paper and mixed paper um, does run somewhere in the 30 to 40 percent overall of what ends up getting marketed, but I could get more precise information. Thank you. But this 98,000, that is what kind of material? Thank you, Madam Mayor. That, that would be from a, collectively a, a mix of all commodities. So um, we, in our initial budget, we had had estimates of um, what the, the total annual value um, and revenue collected would be, and this is um, a, a reduction from them. Thank you. From Marburg. Sorry. OK. And then regarding our proposed um, rates overview, um, this is, they're driven by, by three main areas. Um, again, largely from the increase in compensation to Marburg for collection services per their contract. And it's a CPI adjustment, 70% so of CPI. And then the increase in our county tipping fees across the board for garbage and for recycling materials. And then some balancing up for um, the changes in revenues and processing costs, and, other pro and a, a couple of the programmatic changes. So as you see here, there's more detail about where the revenue requirements um, are being addressed. The, the CPI per contract um, is about 2.6%. Um, we have an annual CPI up, um, increase for public containers, the abandoned waste program, um, for the Environmental Services Division, and then 8.8% increase to the tipping fees for a total of a 12.1% increase in revenue requirements. Madam, Madam Mayor, just to remind you, the 8.8% okay. is to sort of for two things. One, to go from um, $99 a ton this year to 102 next year, but it's also to catch up because is why we're using reserves this year is because we are we didn't factor in the rates to get to one to ninety nine dollars a ton this year, so we're gonna have to catch up for that. So this really reflects two years of rate increases at eight point eight percent. Thank you. And then in reviewing our reserve strategy, again as Mr. Samario just pointed out, the, the projected use of reserves for the remainder of fiscal year 2018 um, is projected to be um, in the neighborhood of $1.6 million. Our balance as of July 1st was uh, a little over $3 million, and so we are looking to have a, a balance at the end of this fiscal year of um, almost $1.4 million, and we don't anticipate any need for the use of reserves in fiscal year 2019 um, based on the $102 per ton for the tipping fee. And then finally, with our key performance objectives, um, as I was pointing out in the, the presentation earlier, our priorities for 2019 are gonna to continue to be around those three main areas. Um, Cleans um, Santa Barbara, particularly around data collection and monitoring and program evaluation to be able to set metrics, and then leading by example, city facility diversion in particular, and then our organics diversion program. So, Queens SB. And for city facilities, um, this is a move for us to lead by example. So this, um, is an opportunity for us over the next two years to bring all of the facilities um, up to 
a 75% diversion goal. And so we have our technical assistance team going around um, facility by facility and working with uh, staff there and our janitorial staff as well to make sure that they understand how the program works. And then we're also assessing the, the service levels at each of the buildings to make sure that they really match up to, to the need and to that goal and making those adjustments. The other element of that is our zero waste events, and these are um, for all of our city-sponsored events, potlucks and, and other things. So we are working, again, with city staff to have a champion at each of the locations so that they understand the services and how to, to order them and how to communicate them. And our goal is to have 90% um, um, diversion at each of the, the city-sponsored events. And then finally, organics recovery and development review. These are um, two, uh, two, several of our P3s are um, um, aimed at organics recovery. And uh, development re review is a new P3 for us this year. It, it's support, an important component of the work that we're doing, particularly for new facilities. It, it allows us to make sure that they have adequate um, space and access to be able to, um, to have the services that they need to also meet um, oftentimes the state you know, um, mandated diversion goals. And I have Hotel Californian up there as um, they're actually a, a shining example of one, someone who's just gone through the new development process and have two of their three restaurants operating at um, very high um, diversion right now, and they have actually even put together their own um, uh, source reduction plan for the facility. Madam Mayor, I just wanted to say first thanks, uh, Ms. Ireley. She's done a great job, been here just over a year. She and her staff have just done a tremendous job expanding what we do, what you heard today. So I'm really proud of them and just wanted to thank her and her staff. Thank you. Well, I agree. And we're open for questions from the council. Um, Mr. Dominguez and then Ms. Sneddon. I'll start by echoing Mr. Samario that uh, Ms. Ireley has done a great job. She came into, into this department a little over a year ago, and I've seen a lot of activity and a lot of results. So kudos and, and thank you very much. Uh, definitely noticed a difference in my district in terms of um, things such as mattresses and, and the bulky items out there. And um, so excited about that. Um, I noticed there were new P3s. There are, it looks like there's four new ones. So that's, again, great work there, uh, adding in more uh, measures for us to take a look at as a council in our in our role at oversight. Um, the one objective I'd love to see added in here is something more related to cost containment or more of a the money side of the budgetary aspect. These are mostly related to the actual service side, and um, it would be great if we could see something more related to the the cost of it. Um, in terms of the food scrap program you mentioned, I think you said there are something like 200 plus people participating. How many more are out there who could be participating? Where are we in terms of getting more universal participation? Thank you, um, Madam Mayor and Council Member Dominguez. Uh, we are well saturated with, with the, the, the larger producers, but there are um, another another um, I would say about 150 or so that are out there that um, we would like to bring into the into the program. So that's as will happen as we continue to to roll the program out and interact with them. So we've gotten the low hanging fruit and vegetables, so to speak. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then going to the the green waste, um, I noticed. In the P3s, it says there's about 15,000 tons projected this year, and then for next year, we're looking at 14,000. What is the uh, explanation why that seems like that might drop? This is on page D46. <coughs> Council.
Council Member Dominguez, I'd actually, I would actually expect it still to be closer to 15,000. I believe that was just a number that we let roll over from the previous year in setting those. Okay, yeah, and, and in fact, your percentage of trash, it stays constant at 28%. And your food scrap stays relatively constant. Is there any way we can try to ratchet those up, or is it are these really just your minimums, but you're, you're going to shoot as a department to increase some of these numbers? Council Member Dominguez, uh, I would say that we always strive to increase those. It is a, a challenge um, when we have such a mature program as we do right now, um, but I would say that depending on how the program ends up performing this year, if we were continuing to see an increase, then we would adjust those numbers. Okay. Yeah, it'd be great if you could slowly try to ratchet these up. Even just stating that as an intention might help shift people's behavior. The, um, so one of the P3s is tons of mixed recyclables diverted from Tahiguis. So if, if we stop being able to sell them or if, if there's no demand and we can't sell them, does that mean these end up in the landfill? Councilmember Dominguez, I'm, right now, no, it, it does not. Um, and part of the reason why I say that is that I, I know that our processors are, and, um, and brokers are looking, are continuing to look for other markets for them. So, um, so we haven't been told that there is no outlet for them as of yet. And there are also um, brokers who are um, who are stockpiling it as well as that they're waiting to, to see how the, the, the markets adjust again. So right, um, so in California, I don't um, know of anyone who is concerned yet that there's no other alternative yet. It might be a slow, slower um, move in getting them through the, the whole marketing um, pipeline, but that landfilling is not yet considered an, an option for recyclables that are being collected currently. Okay, and I've, I've heard some other uh, haulers are actually stockpiling some of the recyclings, and I'm not sure if that's because they can't find a buyer or they think they might be able to get a better price later, but it's, it's a little bit of concern. And, and going back to the bulky item pickup, your uh, P3s for next year is 5,500, and I think in the chart it was some 4,900. So we're looking at a pretty big increase. Now, is that still going to be a complaint-driven program, or are we adding in more routes? Councilmember Dominguez, for, for bulky item um, pickups, it is primarily call-ins, and so it, that is um, tightly tied to the marketing of the program itself that, that we are um, conducting um, with the abandoned waste uh, it, that is a combination of call-ins for complaints but that is also where um, having our code enforcement officer and then potentially some depending how some of these pilots end up panning, panning out and having an increased present Marburg truck presence out as well um, how that will all um, end up shaking out to, to take care of um, abandoned waste. So these pilots are designed to increase the pickups and increase the number of people calling in either for appointments or just reporting it? That, that's, that's correct, yes, yes, on the marketing side, yeah. Okay. And uh, finally, there's, there's a um, nonprofit, Sustains Santa Barbara, and they're partnering with an online presence, We Spire to do a community-wide sustainability program. Have you partnered with them or have you heard from them? I have not uh, yet uh, heard from them. I'm, I, am, oh, I am aware of some of the things that they're doing, but I have, I've not followed up with them. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Snedden. Um, thank you. Uh, first, I wanna say I just, I love your programs and I think the outreach that you do, I mean, the kids get it. Uh, at school, they know how to separate in the food scraps and, it, and it's great diversion. I'm happy to hear you're working with Impact Hub or with businesses also because I think the grown-ups are farther behind um, because of all that great outreach. And the Earth Day event was fantastic, all the different events there and different ways to educate us. We all learned something new there. Um, I do have 
questions. Um, I, I'm seeing as part of your performance objectives that diverting organics and reducing contamination are two main goals. And where, I mean, I think we've talked about this before in terms of the MRF, but it, what is the best way to do that? Are we there? If, if we could divert more, could Agrumin handle our diverted organics? Or um, I don't know if that's too broad of a question, but it does come up with the, the budget. And then I, I, I might as well go ahead with that. If you could give me the history of the tipping fees that, that going up like that, if that's just consistent and without continue to go up, and are we budgeted for that? Just those. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Councilmember Sneddon. I, I'll take the first part of that question, and I'm I, I'll hand off the, more of the history to Mr. Samario. Um, I, the short answer is. Agriman it is it is a, a large business, and they they do have the capacity to process um, all of our um, organics if we would should choose to divert them and have them processed in, in that way. For the commercial program, it's already established. That that's a that's, again, you know, that's a fairly um, straightforward process. With on the residential side. We would have to um, work through what the collection process would look like and, and what those costs associated with that collection and processing would look like um, if, if council desired to, to look at um, having them processed um, through that system. So, does, does that answer your question? It, it, it does. I'm, I'm wondering for my colleagues, too, if we're interested in looking at that, what the cost of that would be um, just in, in light of the increased tipping fees and just to get an idea of our, our budgeting for the future. And it's, and it's one of your main performance objectives is organic diversion and reducing contamination. So the costs of that in comparison. So just to kind of add to that, just and to be more clear, um, so we're talking about a program rolled out to the residential side of things um, it could include a multi-unit as well where we're relying on the residents to sort for us and so we would be looking potentially at having um, organics wet material in one container and then everything dry in another so you can almost consolidate and go from three to two or at least you're not expanding the number of containers you have so there wouldn't be an added cost necessarily to the to the collection it would just be a different way to sort it sorted at the curb um, and that would be, of course, source separated at the curb, and it would be could be processed in the same way as the food scraps we collect in the, in the commercial side are processed with agrimen converted to compost. That's a different conversation than than what the anaerobic digester would do, because you would have the, the trash, right? So that's that's the just diversion. I'm not talking yes. about the anaerobic digester right. or any any of that, but just how to maximize diversion. So, if I mean, I think there's probably a limit to what people will do sure. in separating and then when you have contamination also. So I'm, I'm really not talking about the, the digester, but a MRF or separating or what we could do to right. maximum its diversion. Yeah, and I only mentioned that because you, would, you wouldn't necessarily do both. If you're going to look to get your organics out, you could do it at the curb or you can do it more mechanically. Um, so I guess that's my question is if, if we could, I mean, from if, if with the rest of the council as well into looking into what that would look like to do that ourselves and what that would cost and what the cost benefit might be as, as a budgetary item. You're suggesting that we look at having Marburg have a yellow bin at, for the home? What it, what it would cost to have, I mean, di diversion from the landfill, I, I, I see it as a, as a top priority and and it is environmentally also just aside from the Tahigas issue at all just diversion of organics and I'm interested in what that would cost and and how that would work Mr. Casey would that be something they could explore in the sustainability committee um. yeah I'll defer to Mr. Smario Ms. Irely about how much staff work it would be to kind of pursue that um, seems like something that we could give some initial thought too, but I think Councilmember Sneddon's right, kind of know if there's interest in more than just her to kind of have us yeah, do that yeah. staff work and uh, you could do it now, you could do it as part of the sustainability committee, doesn't matter. 
Okay. Um, okay, and then I had uh, two more on that um, on that triangle about diversion. I mean, diversion was sort of lower down on the triangle, and um, could we do more to feed hungry people or feed animals or more on that? Um, on the priority of how to divert, is there more we could be doing there? Thank you, Councilmember Snedden. Um, I, I, I believe I believe there is, and I think when you're looking at a, a robust program um, in, um, in trying to maximize diversion, there's um, a lot of arrows in the the, the quiver, and that is certainly increasing um, education or um, trying some. Some programming again. I think in, in partnership with with other org organizations and agencies as well to make that effective. There there are op opportunities, and it is becoming um, of of increased interest both at, at the state and, and the federal level to to try to to do more around food rescue. So. Is that it, Mr. Hart? Well, yes, I would. I agree with Councilmember Snedden. If you have the staff time available and can do those, you know, calculations, give us some options and help us understand the trade-offs of, you know, the money, time, uh, benefit equation. I appreciate that. And then just a little more specific, concrete. Um, what is the status of looking at the trash containers, the public trash containers on State Street specifically? Has, has there been a complete inventory of those cans and are they, you know, in a system to be replaced over time? Is there a way to accelerate that and repair those and get those into good shape? I notice somebody seems to be smashing the top of all of the containers. Uh, maybe it's multiple people, I don't know, but they're all dented um, on State Street. I don't know if there's anything you can do about making them more rigid or anything. Um, so please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councilmember, sorry, excuse me, Councilmember Hart. Uh, you have you have read our mind in, in some respects. Uh, yes, uh, all of the the State Street um, containers are also inventoried. We, uh, as a priority this year, had started down in the zero block, the zero to two hundred block, and we are just in the process right now of going to up to the four hundred block, I believe. Um, in terms, and you're, you're quite right, in, they're um, in, in need of, all of them are in need of repair. Um, the lids, as they are being repaired, are, are being switched out from these, um, the older version is quite um, um, malleable and the, the reinfor new reinforced ones should um, prove to be much, much sturdier. Um, we can certainly, We've actually have had some internal conversations about that about State Street and shifting some of the the resources to accelerate its its turnover of containers. Part of the initial plan was to to have obviously some equity a, across the the city so that all areas were were getting new containers. But obviously, State Street is an area of particular Im importance. Um, depending on um, how that might be accelerated and um, the council's desire we could you know we could come back with an update on that too well thank you that'd be appreciated mm -hmm. okay mr dominguez uh, i'm supporting a, a look at these alternatives for organics and i notice you have uh, 8.21 ftes <laughs> what's the point two one or how do we is this just a division of the department <laughs> Sure, Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, you know, we have a lot of folks are allocated across the various department. So, but part of my time is allocated and I'm not sure exactly how it ended up being 8.21, but um, somehow the math worked out to that number, but it's just parts of people's time being allocated to different programs. And I'm assuming you're one of the, the eight. And then I know we have a few uh, staff who do outreach in terms of the recycling and, and waste. What are, what are the seven, other seven positions or? That, th uh, thank you, Council Member Dominguez. Yes, um, I am. I am one of them. Uh, we have three. Um, it, um, oh, yes, that's a good idea. I don't worry. Five enter. You can fancy on me. Pull it back. We have three environmental um, specialists, and they handle some of the 
the broader level um, program development, um, including um, overseeing the technical assistance team, um, rate review and, and setting, um, budget management, and then our uh, clean community program, the Clean SB program. We have two recycling coordinators. They are the, the boots um, on the street. They work, are working directly with the businesses um, in terms of bringing them um, into the program and, and educating them around organics and, and recycling in particular, and then other projects as, as needed. Um, an, an outreach coordinator, um, Brian, he handles all of our um, communications and education, and then we have um, a half an FT for code enforcement right now, and another half for as an admin specialist. And that position assists all of these programs in, in um, some material development and organization, and then also some of um, my budget um, tracking. What does the half a person for code enforcement do? Our code enforcement officer is um, ensuring that all of the, the municipal code uh, around solid waste is being enforced. Um, that tends to be primarily um, focused on businesses, either around um, set out, um, some assistance with contamination, um, and the f but her focus this year in particular has been on um, uh, illegal dumping. So, so How many been, and do we have enforcement actions taking place there? Or? Um, we do. So it, her her first tier is is to attempt to um, educate when possible, but she does have the ability to um, issue um, notices of violation per code. Do you know how many of those we've issued this year? I want to say I would need to get back to you. It's it's usually in the in the several dozen range okay. per year. Great, thank you. thank you. Council Member Friedman. Well, um, thank you for all the work you're doing and uh, it was great to have the comparison that the organic diversion equated to 19 million apples. So to quote Matt Damon from Goodwill Hunting, how about them apples? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to say it. Um, the one, uh, one question I had is uh, on batteries. It's a, it's a big issue on batteries because I know a lot of times we have the electronic waste pickups or you have the ABOT, but people aren't doing that. Can we, is a, my understanding is that you can actually request from Marburg at your house to have a little bucket um, as part of, or is that just for multifamily? Because I, I think that you can, there is a way you can do that to get a bucket as part and it's a free service or not. Thank you, Madam nice Mayor, Councilmember Freeman. Yes, we do have battery recycling, and for residents, it's even simpler than that. If you um, you can actually just put it out in in a plastic bag and put it on top of your cart or can, and it will be collected by the, the truck. I think that's good to know because I, I learned that at Earth Day actually when I was talking to them. And then um, the other question I have is regards the to the homeless encampments. Uh, I know there's a lot of a lot of issues in what is actually collected there, um, public health issues, and especially if you're dealing with creeks and, and other issues. And I look at the budget and I see that you allocated twenty thousand dollars towards that. Um, are we seeing an increase in the complexity of having to clean uh, these sites up and the amount of material? And is twenty thousand um, dollars enough? Thank you, Councilmember Freeman. The twenty thousand dollars is is focused on homeless encampments, uh, either in specifically in neighborhoods, although primarily uh, along uh, one hundred and one and and a lot of the the on and off ramp sort of areas. Um, the Creeks Division does have a, a cleanup program uh, as well, and so they focus on. Um, the channels themselves for any um, cleanup, either of litter or or homeless encampments. So I, I can't sp I can't speak to them. There's, I would say that this year was also a, a data gathering, um, you know, opportunity for us to see how well we all of the divisions coordinate amongst each other, um, and um, and make an, an improvement in those those cleanups. I I think. Um, we have shown that um, that it, it can be quite um, successful, and given that amount of money, I would I 
would feel like we are, um, that we're, we're maintaining um, those sites and those levels. And, and anything additional really would be a, a policy question. Very great. Thank you. And then the last uh, not a question, I'll be supporting the effort to look at the alternatives for the, um, for the uh, um, diversion on it. Thank you. And Madam Mayor, I just what I might suggest is I'm not sure how long it's going to take for us to have that information. It's, I think it's going to take a little time, but we're scheduled to come back with you in less than six months now. I think we're scheduled to come back in September with kind of an update on the resource recovery project. Uh, we can give you some information then. If we have it sooner, we can come back to you sooner, but at least at, at a minimum we can kind of get to you in September as part of that update. If that okay. works for all of you. That sounds good. Okay, good um, budget review today. Uh, thank you to our Solid Waste staff and the Spirit of Service Awards are Wednesday yep. and our council members are invited, right? 1130 at Chase Palm Park. Right. It's very uplifting to see what people Absolutely. are doing. And then I run into community members who have got, received the award in the past and they remember it and it's a badge of honor for them. So oh. it's, it's a good thing. Um, our next budget hearing is next Monday, 2 p.m., same, same time, same place, and we'll be looking at our parks and recreation, creeks and golf funds. And then we have a city council meeting tomorrow. Can't forget that, 2 p.m., right here. Um, Thank this, you. This meeting is adjourned. Madam Mayor. This sorry. meeting's not adjourned. Do, do we not need a motion then to have staff look at that? Is that not a big enough ticket item where you want to? We seem to be in agreement. Mr. Colon. If Mr. Casey wants to acknowledge the assignment, that's fine. Exactly. I can count past four, and I think we have clear direction to bring some information back, and we'll spend a, a reasonable amount of staff time on it and then gauge your interest about whether you want to pursue it more thoroughly or not. Thank Meeting you. Meeting adjourned.